would like to thank all our faculty for sharing their knowledge and expertise with all speciality in such challenging times. We wish all our audience a healthy and safe days ahead and we hope these webinars add value to your time. These webinars are dependent on internet speed, which might be at times unstable. Please bear with us for any issues with internet. Today, we are going to have Delhi Arthropedic Association and DMSOG uh, webinar on malignant bone tumors. Now, I hand over to Manish Dhawan, sir, to start the webinar. Good evening, everyone. I welcome you all for the second series of uh, orthopedic oncology. Previously, last to last week, we had on benign tumors. So this webinar is conducted by Delhi Orthopedic Association and Delhi Musculoskeletal Oncology. So I am Dr. Manish Dhawan. I am the moderator of this whole uh, webinar. And uh, webinar convener is Dr. Akshay Tiwari. So I welcome, first of all, I welcome uh, Dr. Akshay Tiwari. Dr. Uh, we have three speakers, Dr. Shriram Rajan, Dr. Uh, Manish Agarwal, and Dr. Akshay. And our expect panel is Dr. Professor Dr. Lalit Mani, Dr. Yogesh, Dr. Chetan Anchan, Dr. Arav Sagar, Devrat Arya, Dr. Amit Sahu, and Dr. Ramba Pandey. And uh, first, uh, before we start, I have uh, I share my thank with Ortho TV and especially Dr. Ashok Sham and Dr. Shamshul Huda for uh, giving us this opportunity and organizing this webinar. So, so I request Dr. Sharad Agrawal, President Delhi Orthopedic Association to uh, speak few words. Dr. Sharad, please. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Manish. Good evening, friends. Thanks to you all for joining today's webinar of Delhi Orthopedic Association. My thanks to Dr. Akshay Tiwari and his eminent faculty for preparing this webinar on malignant bone tumors. The bone tumors are always an enigma for orthopedic surgeons, especially the malignant ones. The topics chosen today are very basic and shall be of interest to all of us. And the subsequent case discussions shall give us a plethora of learning. All in all, it shall be a useful and informative learning. My special thanks to Dr. Manish, Dr. Shamshul Hoda, Dr. Ashok Sham for working hard behind the doors to make this do-up webinar a huge success. Thank you. I uh, request Dr. Akshay to please introduce the faculty, the speakers, and the panelists. Dr. Akshay, please. Thank you, uh, Dr. Manish and Dr. Sharad. Uh, it's an honor to introduce uh, a very eminent faculty from across the country. This is the second webinar in a series of two webinars. The first one, as we know, was on benign bone tumors. And on behalf of Delhi Orthopedic Association and the Delhi Musculoskeletal Oncology Group, I welcome you all to the second uh, webinar of this series. Uh, today, we'll be focusing on uh, specifically on malignant bone tumors and more than malignant bone tumors per se, what a general orthopedic practitioner needs to know about malignant bone tumors in his orthopedic practice is going to be the subject of uh, today's webinar. We have doctor, uh, we have three very good lectures by Dr. Sriram Rajan from uh, Mahajan Imaging Delhi, uh, from uh, Dr. Manish Agarwal from Hinduja Hospital Mumbai and myself. And uh, we have an extremely uh, good panel lined up, uh, very good experts from across the country. The panel is going to be moderated by Dr. Yogesh Panchwak from Pune. And the panelists are Dr. Lalit Mani from Delhi, Dr. Chetan Anchan from Mumbai, Dr. R.R. Saggar from Jalandhar, Dr. Devavrat Arya from Delhi, Dr. Amit Sahu, the radiologist from Max Institute, uh, Delhi, and Dr. Rambha Pandey, the radiation oncologist from All India Institute of Medical Sciences, Delhi. I invite Dr. Uh, Sriram Rajan to uh, start uh, with the talk on radiology for orthopedic surgeons, how not to miss a malignancy. Dr. Sriram Rajan. Thank you, uh, Dr. Akshay. And um, so without any further delay, let me start this thing. My topic is on radiology for orthopedic surgeons, how not to miss a malignancy. So, uh, when to shift from uh, an x-ray, curettage, or clinical follow-up to MR and biopsy. So these are the top things that we need to look for. If we think that the lesion is aggressive, if there's an increase in size, if there's a large soft tissue mass, either on x-ray or on CT or on MR, if there is pain in the absence of injury or fracture, if there is vanishing matrix, if initially there is some 
calcification and in the subsequent x-ray we see that it's vanishing which means that it's an aggressive lesion and finally if there is complex anatomy we need to do further imaging and sometimes you might need to go for a biopsy <clears throat> we've already discussed some of these uh, ways of assessment of a bone tumor like uh, we look at the margin matrix pattern of bone destruction periosteal reaction and soft tissue mass Typically, if there is a sclerotic and a narrow uh, sclerotic margins with a narrow zone of transition, that's more likely to be benign. And typically, if you have a naked lesion, that is more likely to be uh, aggressive. There are exceptions to all of these rules, like a giant cell tumor typically is naked, or a, a brown tumor of HPT can have naked margins. But taken as a rule, if you find there are margins which are non-sclerotic, chances are much higher that it's an aggressive lesion. What we mean by a wide zone of transition is that we cannot identify as a pinpoint between normal and abnormal uh, tissue. If the matrix, we, we are very familiar with looking at osseous or cotton woolly matrix, cartilaginous rings and arcs, fibrous or ground glass matrix. And if there is loss of matrix over time, like I mentioned, we are again thinking of a malignant lesion. Uh, I'm going to cover some of these other topics in uh, radiographs, like looking at how geographic lytic lesions are. Uh, when they're aggressive, it's moth eaten or permeative. Uh, let me just jump to the images. So if you see this, the image on the left-hand side, you can make out that there's a lesion with a geographic lytic uh, uh, pattern and it has sclerotic margins. As we go more towards more poorly defined uh, matrix, uh, the poorly defined destruction, you have a moth eaten appearance over here and you have a permeative pattern. So we're talking about more aggressive or more malignant uh, lesions. Patterns of periosteal reaction, this is what we mean as a unilamellar or solid periosteal reaction where there is very good bone formation, which means it's given enough time for the body to lay down bone. If it's multilamellar, typically that's an aggressive lesion. Uh, in our uh, topic, whenever we look at an aggressive uh, lesion like this, the top things that we look th think of are round cell tumors like Ewing sarcoma, some infections and sometimes osteosarcoma. You can have perpendicular periosteal uh, reaction or we can have a Codman's triangle. If you have a very thin, uh, very faint looking triangle which is raised up over here, that's typically what's a Codman's triangle. I'm going to deal with some of the exceptions to these rules. But typically if you see something going towards multilamellar, perpendicular or a Codman's triangle, we are going towards even more of a malignant or an aggressive lesion. Looking at cases, this is a 19 year old male. His presentation was pain and swelling in the lower left thigh and noticed after a football match. Now, typically, many of these things, if there is a history of injury that can act as a red herring, this patient did not have any constitutional symptoms and was not very uh, sick or ill. The x-ray shows naked margins of a lesion, which is metadiaphyseal, and it has a wide zone of transition. We can't say that whether it stops over here or, and whether there's a normal bone over here. So there's, there is a wider area in which the uh, lesion is involving it. It's geographic lytic and there's quite a large soft tissue even seen on the x-ray posteriorly and medially. Now, these are the features which we're looking at. So one is we have, we have this uh, pain and swelling. We have very aggressive features and we have large soft tissue, which implies that we need to go ahead for further imaging and a biopsy. This is uh, a 23-year-old uh, male with pain in the left shoulder, no constitutional symptoms, x-rays, show a sclerotic lesion with a wide zone of transition. Again, you can't see it very nicely. You know that it's, it, it might be somewhere over here or the lesion might be somewhere over here. Matrix is sclerotic. There is a Codman's triangle, this faint wispy triangle, which is seen over here. And there appears to be some soft tissue. All of these features imply that we need to upgrade our uh, treatment and go in for further imaging. Uh, now, talking about complex anatomy, if you look at the image over here, this is a pelvis with both hips of a... 18 year old female with left hip pain. Uh, if we were to look at this radiograph, what would we try to see? We would try to compare symmetry. Here we see that there seems to be some lucency, which is asymmetrical, which may or may not be abnormal. There is some sclerosis, which again is asymmetrical, which is a little bit suspicious and it's away from the bowel shadow. Now, if the, there is left sided pain, there is lucency and there is some sclerosis. Why do we need imaging? Because you can sometimes end up with something like this, that there is this marrow involvement, large soft tissue component, and uh, new bone formation like we saw in the soft tissues on the x-ray. All of this again points towards an osteosarcoma. Now, 
when we see some lesion like this, we see a mottled ring and arc pattern of calcification. What do we think? First, look at the clinical picture. A 54-year-old lady, that means it's older. Pain in the lower thigh, that is very important. The x-ray shows this ring and arc pattern of mineralization. There seems to be a lucent halo around the lesion. That means uh, this typically could be an enchondroma, but what we are not happy about is uh, one, the pain, and second is the lucent halo around it. And there's apparent narrow zone of transition. Typically, the bone scan is showing some amount of uptake. Now, when we're looking at a chondromatous lesion, most of the chondromatous lesions don't have uh, much uptake on bone scan. Enchondroma sometimes can do it, but in a younger age group. In this case, pain in an elderly individual with lucent halo, naked margins, and uh, bone scan showing uptake, all of these things basically go for further imaging and go for biopsy. This is a very strange case. This is a 16-year-old female, pain in the lower thigh since four months, no trauma, no prior infection. This is very important. The history is very important because if we had the same x-ray in an uh, individual with a history of prior uh, fever or any injury, we could think of a chronic osteomyelitis. But we are seeing an expansion with cortical thickening and a very poorly defined lucent area with patchy lucency with a wide zone of transition. Now, if you go on for further imaging and here at the center of it, we see punctate calcifications that implies it's a chondromatous lesion. So when we come to a chondromatous lesion with all of these pictures, the answer becomes very ghastly, a chondrosarcoma. It's extremely uncommon to see it in a younger age group, but this is one thing which you need to look for. It's an eight-year-old sick-looking child with pain in the left thigh since one month, elevated ESR. Now, such a picture could typically be seen in two conditions. You have, when you have a permeative lesion, wide zone of transition, we have some amount of lamellations over here in the periosteal reaction and cortical thickening. This could have been osteomyelitis. The clue to it is that there is cortical thickening instead of cortical destruction. Typically in acute osteomyelitis, if we get this kind of a picture, we'll have cortical thinning, endosteal scalloping. We won't have cortical thickening unless it is an acute on subacute osteomyelitis. History is mandatory. We need that definitely. So this is an Ewing sarcoma. Uh, typically, uh, we, we have some differentials. Like we have, this is from a, a very good article. 59-year-old female, pain, swelling, lytic lesion. Whenever you see a, a lytic lesion in relation to a joint or a bursa, and uh, we are wondering what is going on. This is not degenerative. This uh, actually violates some rules because typically when you see infection, you should see osteopenia. You should not see a sclerotic margin. TB is one of the things which can look like this. The clues are narrow zone of transition and you have extraosseous bone fragments. These are not the newborn formation which we tend to see in osteosarcoma. Uh, again, this is another case. This seems to be a old healed fracture. Uh, it's a 57 year old male with pain in the left thigh. But the problem is that there is this kind of strange permeative lytic area which you're seeing within the uh, femur and you're seeing a small amount of soft tissue coming about. You do a further imaging and you can see a larger soft tissue component. Now in our country, we can still see osteomyelitis in an abscess looking like that. But in such cases, we should always ask for a contrast study. If you see enhancement, solid enhancement, you're talking about a, a bone tumor. This thing was, was a lymphoma. What about when you see a change in matrix? Uh, so this is a 66-year-old female with pain in the proximal left leg. You're seeing a typical fibrovascular membrane, which is top, typically seen with a medullary bone infarct. But inferiorly, there is erosion of the fibrovascular membrane, and there's also cortical destruction. There's a wide zone of transition. All of these are... Uh, suggestive of a neoplasm occurring within a uh, prior bone infarct. Uh, I've got the last two set of uh, images which I'm going to be sharing with you. This is a 17-year-old male with pain and swelling in the right thigh. We're seeing an expansile lytic lesion, large soft tissue component. If you can see that there is some uh, amorphous newborn formation within the soft tissue, which is uh, kind of suggestive of an osteosarcoma. It has a wide zone of transition. Here you're seeing some small fluid levels coming in over here. So if you see a large soft tissue component with fluid levels and on a setting that you're thinking of an osseous lesion, it's likely to be a telangiectatic OS. 
Now the problem comes that sometimes when we we get these lesions which are large and expansile, we want to figure out what is the other differentials. What can it be? Now, if you see this lesion over here, it's a destructive lesion, multiple fluid fluid levels. But on the contrast, the septa and uh, even the walls they are showing some pattern of solid enhancement. This is a telangiectatic OS, the large soft tissue component with enhancement of the septa and the walls. Whereas here there is another expansile lytic lesion, multiple fluid fluid levels, contained lesion comparatively, and there is very thin septal en enhancement, and this is typical of a aneurysmal bone cyst. So basically, the, the take-home point is when to shift from X-ray curettage, keeping conventional management, going on to further imaging and biopsy. The lesion is aggressive. If there's an increase in size, soft tissue mass, pain in the absence of uh, injury or fracture, a vanishing matrix, and complex anatomy. That's all uh, for my lecture, and thank you for your patience. Thank you, Dr. Shriram. Dr. Akshay. Dr. Akshay, can you hear me? Yes. Do you want discussion now or we go for, uh, for your uh, lecture now? We'll leave the discussion for the panel discussions. Okay, I invite Dr. Akshay to come uh, to uh, speak on uh, uh, about the biopsy and bone tumors. Dr. Akshay, please. Thank you, Dr. Manish, and thank you, Dr. Sriram, for that very informative uh, lecture on uh, radiology for malignant bone tumors. And that is what sets the stage, not, not just now, but in any clinical scenario that we see. Uh, imaging, a good imaging always uh, precedes biopsy, and that is uh, the rule that you always follow. Uh, in the next 8 to 10 minutes, I'll be talking about all that a general orthopedic practitioner needs to know about biopsy for bone tumors particularly malignant bone tumors. But before I go on, what's the big deal? Well, these lesions, uh, primary malignant bone tumors are rare. Uh, a, a routine general orthopedic practitioner will probably uh, encounter one or two malignant bone tumors like osteosarcomas or even sarcomas in one year of his practice. And that is what makes these lesions very special because if you are encountering them rarely, you are more liable to make mistakes. Uh, before I go on, I would want to uh, mention two big names here. One is, uh, of course, we are never tired of mentioning these two papers by Mankin. The first one was in 1982, where he uh, send, uh, sent questionnaires across uh, various orthopedic practitioners and what happened to patients who underwent biopsy. And he could see that unnecessary amputations were performed in 4.5% 4, 4 of patients. Uh, and majority of these were because of poorly or wrongly performed biopsies. He went on to uh, revisit the same questions uh, 14 years later in 1996. And he could see again that the errors, complications, and changes still remained. And a, a lot of loss of limbs and lives could be traced back to a wrongly done biopsy. Today is the time of... Uh, of, of uh, exploding knowledge. All our patients are uh, quite aware as to what is best for them and the society demands more and more from us. Before we go on to think that biopsy is an innocent or a small procedure, we should be aware of a danger lurking uh, very close by, both for the patient and for the surgeon. Jaffe in 1958 said that a biopsy is to be regarded as the final diagnostic procedure, not as a shortcut to diagnosis. What he meant by saying this was that biopsy should uh, only follow a good imaging, a good clinical history, and only then the biopsy can be done and uh, 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 the correct diagnosis can be arrived at. So I'll uh, split uh, my talk into two, what to do and what not to do in biopsy. The first do is to suspect. Of course, unless you suspect, you're not going to biopsy it we have to have a low threshold for suspecting or a suspicion of a malignant bone tumor. Uh, when do we suspect? When, when the, the, the size of any swelling is more than five centimeters, it is lying deep to deep fascia, it is increasing in size over time, it is painful, and if the radiological features are suggestive of malignancy, we must subject these patients to biopsy. We have to ask any history of previous malignancy, the mode of onset, the, the aggressiveness of the progression, whether the progression has been fast or slow, and family history will lead us to the correct uh, uh, differentials before we go ahead uh, for a biopsy. 
this patient was walking around with uh, the diagnosis for osteosarcoma on biopsy and we could see an aggressive looking lesion on the mr and also on the x ray all we needed to know was that the patient was under was having some bodybuilding exercises a tendon swelling appeared and over time the swelling gradually hardened with reduction in pain this clinched the diagnosis of a myositis and we could revisit the imaging and with an expert radiologist we could see and what all all we needed to do was follow up with x rays and mris and we can see all the the edema has gone and it was actually only myositis needing that no treatment uh, the next do is to consult we have to be sure that we consult the right musculoskeletal radiologist pathologist how to send a biopsy where to send a biopsy and then of course your oncology friends uh, will come in handy whenever you plan to do a biopsy on a patient the rules of imaging have to be followed before we go on to biopsy all imaging should be done at least all local imaging should be done before you go on to biopsy a patient staging of course if you think it's a malignancy you can do before biopsy also before uh, jumping on to uh, the procedure uh, which appears small and innocuous we must ask ourselves whether a biopsy is really required a lesion like this will quite often pop up in your practice uh, in in uh, a patient who had some injury or some pain in the local area as incidentalomas most of these lesions if we see are are not going to require any treatment this was a non ossifying fibroma the other do is to refer if you think you are not the right person to biopsy you should be referring this patient as we saw in mankins paper biopsies are recommended to be done only at centers where definitive treatment of sarcoma can be done so we should know whether we are going to perform the definitive surgery for a patient or not if not then probably even a biopsy should be done at a center where a malignancy will be ultimately treated we must use image guidance whenever required if the if the uh, uh, lesion is not clinically palpable or apparent and especially in patients uh, with lesions of the spine of the pelvis or sacrum uh, an image guidance which can be a cm or a ct guidance or sometimes even pet can guide our biopsy because we might want to target areas which are more aggressive and more likely to uh, yield tissue which will lead us to the diagnosis which technique to use is a very common question for all orthopedic surgeons well we all have uh, uh, are are now agreeing that and most of my colleagues will agree that a core biopsy under local anesthesia is possible in majority of cases it's of course an opd procedure it is possible to do it under local anesthesia the least complication rates as compared to uh, open biopsy Uh, and uh, i think the, we we do more than 90% or even 95% of our patients are diagnosed only on a core biopsy which is performed uh, mostly once sometimes even twice so what about open biopsy well it should be rarely required and it is acceptable if uh, we are uh, sticking to the principles of biopsy which i'll be coming to in ne next few slides in our practice in the practice of the orthopedic oncologist we do an open biopsy only when a large amount of material is required or in case of failed core biopsies maybe we can we have repeated once or twice or even thrice uh, that is when we resort to an open biopsy a biopsy incision as is always taught during residency and remains very very important is that it has to be in line with the final incision for surgery which is why you should know the final incision of a limb salvage surgery for any bone tumor and it is important again to reemphasize that the biopsy ideally should be done at a center where limb salvage surgeries are routinely done this is for everyone to see on internet uh, and in in malavas textbook uh, distal femur can be approached both medially and laterally similarly proximal tibia and the shoulder most of the biopsy Uh, route that you take will depend on where the soft tissue component is lying and also while avoiding uh, contaminating a joint or an uninvolved bone or a neurovascular bundle you will also always want to stick to a single muscle compartment so if it's a lesion like this lying to lying posterior to the distal femur we will avoid taking a posterior route contaminating neurovascular bundle we'll avoid taking a transarticular or route or route to the joint so we'll usually approach it either medially or laterally without contaminating much of an involved bone if we have to do an open biopsy we must avoid raising flaps i always say an open biopsy is a is should be like a big needle biopsy if you're using a curette or any other instrument 
make a, a, a sharp, neat cut through a single muscle compartment. Having read your imaging well before doing biopsy really helps. When you have done a sharp and direct uh, approach, you have breached a single compartment. You enter and take tissue out just like you would do with a needle. You should not be using much of uh, retractors. It's not really required to have a good look at the tumor and the, the, uh, the flaps should be a minimum. A good hemostasis is very important because we don't want a big hematoma that is contaminated. That may complicate related to surgery. Drain is best avoided. If at all you have to put a drain, it has to be distal and in line with the incision of the open biopsy. Suture placement is again leads to a lot of loss of skin sometimes and a, a bite close to the open biopsy incision really helps. We also should read the imaging, uh, maybe sit down with the radiologist friend and try uh, biopsying representative areas. A soft tissue component is just as good as the bone. We don't need to enter the bone if there is a big soft tissue component. We have to avoid cystic and necrotic areas when we are planning a biopsy. What about FNAC? Of course, FNAC is a very uh, easy to do procedure in the OPD. Uh, a lot of pathologists them, do it themselves. But uh, we must say here that FNAC is an unreliable procedure for a primary diagnosis of a primary bone tumor. This patient had a lesion in the proximal tibial epiphysis and an FNAC was ordered, which showed a giant cell rich lesion. The patient curatage thinking it was a giant cell tumor and lo and behold, it was actually a giant cell rich osteosarcoma. Now the patient and the surgeon both are in trouble. What about excision biopsy? We'll reserve it for the rare case where we do not actually need a biopsy and we can uh, we need to take out a lesion such as an, uh, as an osteochondroma where we are sure that uh, it is an osteochondroma without even a biopsy. Sometimes a small bony or soft tissue mass which is excisable with wide margins without much functional or anatomical morbidity again can be subjected to an, open, uh, uh, an excision biopsy. But we have to beware of the mimic whenever we are biopsying uh, an osteoporotic fracture uh, um, uh, a myeloma mimicking osteoporosis, a giant cell rich osteosarcoma mimicking giant cell tumors. Uh, and as Dr. Sriram said, the lymphatic osteosarcomas of chondrosarcs can mimic their benign counterparts. So we have to be aware of these entities to suspect and to let the radiology and pathology friends know that these are the mimics that you are keeping in mind. A few slides on what not to do when you are going about doing a biopsy. This is again very important. Number one is nothing. You should not presume that a lesion is what you're thinking it is unless you have a good proof. The sacral mass was treated with anti tubercular treatment for nine months and it, all it needed was a small needle biopsy to prove that it's actually a giant cell tumor. It needed treatment and not ATT. We should not mix biopsy with fixation or with curatage because this may ultimately either turn out to be unnecessary or may it may actually complicate or contraindicate limb salvage. This, dis this uh, distal metaphyseal lesion in the femur was curated by the unaware orthopedic surgeon and also nailed for stability. Well, he achieved stability, but the histopathology showed osteosarcoma and we could see there is a huge recurrence there. And uh, this is what resulted in, an, uh, in a limb which otherwise was quite uh, amenable to limb salvage. Again, uh, repeating, but uh, repeating because it's very important. Don't biopsy if you're not sure that you are the right person to biopsy. A biopsy of a pelvic osteosarcoma through the gluteus maximus led to a hindquarter amputation because the whole flap was contaminated. A similar case where the biopsy was done rightly resulted in, in internal hemipelvectomy and uh, salvage of the limb. Avoid drains, as I said, if possible, but if at all you have to put drains after your biopsy, you have to put them in line with the incision and distal to the incision. Again, do not divide tissue amongst two labs. It is uh, not a good practice because sarcomas are heterogeneous. You might end up uh, sending one uh, type of tissue to one lab and the other type in the other lab. If at all you have to have a second review, send the whole thing to one lab and uh, get slides and blocks from there and send to another lab if you want. Where to send is very important. Be sure of the lab with all due respect. We have very busy pathologists in, in the peripheral centers. but. Uh, Quite a few pathologists will not be seeing many bone and soft tissue tumors. If you think your pathologist uh, may not be that well versed with these lesions, seek more opinions. Send the blocks elsewhere to a more expert pathologist. 
uh, and this particularly is important when you think uh, the clinical and radiology uh, picture is not matching with the diagnosis on pathology. Again, don't traverse multiple planes or compartments when you are biopsying. Avoid transverse incisions or those which are not in line with uh, the uh, ultimate uh, limb salvage surgery scar. Avoid multiple scars. If you think one scar has failed to give you a diagnosis, try and use the same scar to biopsy a different area. So if you see a skeletal lesion, you might be tempted to cure it and bone graft it. You might start thinking what on earth it can be. You might uh, uh, want to biopsy and at the same time fix it. And you might want to start ATT and see what happens. Well, only the second uh, step is the right step, especially in today's times. And if you, once you start thinking, you investigate further, you look at the clinical, the biochemistry, the radiology, and then you think whether this lesion merits a biopsy first and a proper diagnosis before you embark upon treatment. The sequence has to be a careful clinical evaluation, analysis of the imaging studies, and then biopsy. And it can never be uh, from clinical straight away to biopsy. Doing a biopsy and then going about uh, imaging is a very, very bad idea. The diagnosis of all must fit. And as Jaffe said, diagnosis is the end of uh, the diagnostic. Uh, the biopsy is uh, the end of uh, uh, the diagnostic uh, procedure and not the beginning. Diagnosis has to be questioned when any three, any of these three do not match. To conclude, uh, we have to keep a high index of suspicion for bone tumors. We will not picking up many malignancies early enough if we do not start thinking about them being a real possibility. We have to refer early if malignancy is suspected in case we think we are not at a center which, which treats malignant bone tumors. We should biopsy only if we are sure we should be doing it. And we should avoid treatment on presumptive diagnosis. Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Akshay, for such an informative lecture. I request uh, Professor Manish Agarwal. Professor Manish Agarwal. Yes. Who we read ready with his lecture. So we take discussion at the end after your lecture. Is my screen uh, visible? Yes, yes, yes it, it is. is visible. Yeah. Okay, now, now, Akshay gave me a very interesting topic about uh, the things that I wish that the orthopedic surgeons would keep in mind. And there are many of them. There are far more than 10. But I'm going to repeat a few which Dr. Sriram as well as Dr. Akshay said because uh, despite repeating them again and again over the last 20 years, it looks like we've not been heard and the same mistakes keep uh, happening again and again. So I'm going to focus on those things which I wish every orthopedic surgeon would know so that we don't cause any harm to our patients and we end up doing a proper job and getting a proper uh, limb as as well as uh, saving the lives of our patients. So to begin with, I'm going to start with a repetition. The first thing I wish is that we avoid what I call as the oculobrachial reflex. For those who don't know, look at this guy sitting in a chair with trauma. I think all of us orthopedic surgeons are quite used to, to seeing the x-rays, analyzing them deciding what kind of implants are required, which fracture is to be fixed. I mean, we use a lot of our cortical material and matter to decide what should be the treatment for trauma. But somehow when we see a tumor, there is a short circuit. And that is what I call as an oculobrachial reflex. Somehow we pick up the knife and end up trying to remove this tumor. And that ends up with disaster. So the first thing that I wish orthopedic surgeons would remember is you are not going to do an exigen biopsy ever. I think the exigen biopsies have to be done in the hands of the experts to avoid any kinds of problems. This is what happens when we don't follow the rules. Somebody tried to remove a popliteal tumor, ended up contaminating the neurovascular bundle and the only option that was left was an amputation. This is another big deep tumor in the leg, in the anterolateral compartment. But somebody tried to do an excision and we ended up uh, uh, having a serious disaster. We were having to require a um, big flap and a uh, lot of muscle excision. So the question next asked is, what do you do for these small superficial tumors that sometimes come? Even these, in my opinion, 
if you do an exigent biopsy, it has to be done with a margin like this. Get a frozen section done to make sure that you have got a good margin and that the tumor is benign or malignant so that you have a chance to devise the margin if any of the margin is closed, particularly if you're dealing with a high-grade sarcoma. This one particularly turned out to be a very high-grade sarcoma and we were very happy that we took it out with a white margin. Second thing that I wish for orthopedic surgeons is you have to be careful of what we call as chronic hematomas. Now I'm going to illustrate this with this case. This was a man who had a trivial fall. He had been on anticoagulants for some of his cardiac reasons. Now he fell down and six months after that, he had a swelling in the thigh. We started increasing in size. He had pain. There was nothing on the X-ray. His uh, bloods were normal. His MRI was done. This is what the pictures you can see. It was reported as a hematoma in the anterolateral thigh. It's a very large one. Surgeon believed the report, went ahead, did exploration, did a drainage, and didn't get much of blood, got a little bit of bleeding, but not much of blood. Did not send any material either for culture or for histology. Two weeks later, this patient, instead of settling, developed fever, had high WBC counts, discharged from the operating side, had still severe pain. At this time, a CT angio was done by the surgeon because there was some bleeding on the original side. They were suspecting a hematoma. They thought they may be able to embolize the bleeder. Uh, they finally uh, thought that this is a, still a hematoma coming over a period of time. So they did a re-debridement. This time they did send for culture, which grew acinetobacter. They started the patient on antibiotics. Discharge pain persisted, and the fever started becoming higher and higher with WBC counts rising. Finally, another 15 days later, this patient was referred to our hospital in a toxic state, suspected of gas gangrene with a deranged coag profile, very tender, uh, firm swelling in the anterolateral thigh. Patient was toxic, it was taken in as an emergency. The unsuspecting orthopedic surgeon who had this case ended up uh, believing this was infection, went down to do a debridement as an urgent procedure. It was very vascular. It required an argon plasma cautery to control the bleeding. But the surgeon immediately realized that something is wrong here. This is not an infection. This looked like a tumor. So whatever necrotic tumor was there, he debrided, finally managed to close the, uh, stop the bleeding and, and left the wound open and closed it. Now we got enterobacter culture. There were antibiotics which required to be given, including cholestin, because it's a very resistant bug. And the histology was a high-grade pleomorphic sarcoma. PET CT showed multiple tiny meds. So at this point of time, the infection had to be controlled. So a VAC was put in. And three days later, we went ahead and did a complete wide excision. Now the important thing here is that chronic hematoma is a myth. We shouldn't believe it ourselves. We shouldn't believe the radiologist who reports it. And if you go back and see these MRI pictures, it was very clear that this was a tumor from the very beginning. So as a rule, even if you get a report or even if you're suspecting an IND, do not, I mean, do a suspecting a hematoma, don't do an IND is, is what I would advise. An example is this another 11 year old girl, acute history, fell down in school, within four days has a tense swelling in the back of the knee. It was reported as a hematoma on ultrasound. You can see these MRI pictures. It looks like there is uh, something which is not collecting any contrast. There was a peripheral enhancement. Looked like a hematoma, but we did not believe it. It was fortunately referred. We did a biopsy and this was actually an infarcted synovial sarcoma. And because we had the correct diagnosis without having tried to do an iron. We were able to go ahead and remove and excise this tumor and this patient remains disease free. The next thing that I wish for surgeons, orthopedic surgeons, is to stop doing a surgical ex excision of fibromatosis. We know that fibromatosis is going to keep recurring again and again. 
and there is no need of surgical excision because we've got very good medical management. In fact, most of the times fibromatosis probably does not require anything except observation. Many of them will just stop growing over a period of time. And if you operate them, then they become aggressive and they require uh, bigger and bigger surgeries of, which are of no use. So a clear rule is if you see fibromatosis, do not operate on fibromatosis. The fourth thing that I wish is that when we order imaging, I'm sure Dr. Sriram will agree with me, I think we need to give some explicit instructions for MRI. I think when we look at tumors, you can't order an MRI region. Well, you, could, you don't say MRI of the knee, we don't say MRI of the shoulder because those sequences are different. When we are suspecting a tumor, I would order an MRI, I would call up my radiologist, tell them that I'm suspecting a tumor, when a tumor sequence is done, it has to be from joint to joint like we do for trauma. You have to do all the sequences because if you order just an MRI knee, you just get PD sequences. You don't get the T1, T2 stir sequences, which are important at times to make a diagnosis or to make a differential diagnosis. We need to screen the entire bone. Otherwise, we may sometimes miss the skips. And I would give instructions to collect the imaging in a CD so that I can view them in magnification in a DICOM format, allows me to plan my surgeries uh, with a scale. And a question often asked is, do I need a contrast? And I always say that, yes, we should get a contrast done. If you don't know whether we need a contrast or not, better to get a contrast study done. It's a good idea if available to get a 3D study because the images are far superior. They are of much better contrast and clearly will help us delineating the tumor margins and planning our limb salvage surgery. Now, contrast is very useful, as I said, because one thing it tells you whether you have a cystic lesion or a solid lesion. It also tells you which is the area where you're going to direct the biopsy to. So you can see, like in this particular case, where, where you have uh, this, this particular lesion, is you see the olecranon, you know that the, if, you, if you biopsy the other areas, you're going to get a negative biopsy. Biopsy the area which is picking up contrast, you'll end up getting a diagnosis. The fifth thing is that radiology reports by radiologists who don't have the experience in, in dealing with tumors or tumor-like regions are very often misleading and we shouldn't believe them. I'll give you examples of this case which I showed before. This was reported as a hematoma. And like I told you, hematomas are myths. We shouldn't believe this report. Unfortunately, this was a synovial sarcoma. And because the surgeon tried to evacuate it again, as I told you, we required very big surgery, excision, and a free flap to save the limb. Another young boy, 15-year-old, looks like a lytic sclerotic lesion with a solid periosteal reaction. MR sequences show heterogeneity. You can't be certain about what this is, but the radiologist reported this as an osteomyelitis. Unfortunately, the surgeon believed it, debrided it, only to be surprised to find this is an osteosarcoma. And this is quite frequent. And therefore, the REX rule that we come to is that not only should you not believe the radiology report, but we shouldn't believe anything to be benign unless we have proven otherwise. Akshay spoke about this during the biopsy. And again, as a rule, I think before we operate anything, it's a good idea to get a biopsy done, prove what we are thinking, and then only go in. This is a classic example of a girl. It looks like a benign lesion. No imaging was done. Surgeon went ahead and curated it. We were talking about doing an X-ray and curatage for something which looks benign. I don't think it should ever be done because this turned out to be a high-grade sarcoma, osteosarcoma. And this now is a, is a more difficult problem to do a limb-saving surgery. Similarly, we know that giant cell tumors are common in the distal radius. This one looked benign, does not show any periosteal reaction. But after the surgeon debrided this, thinking it's a giant cell tumor, realized this is an osteosarcoma. So again, the general rule is never assume anything to be benign. If you're going to operate, it is better to get a biopsy done. Another lesion which looks absolutely benign, even on the MRI showed multiple fluid fluid levels. There was some edema around it. 
but there are clear fluid fluid levels and on biopsy fortunately which was done this was a high grade telangiectatic osteosarcoma so the message again is that benign looking lesions can turn out to be a high grade sarcoma and don't operate them unless and until a biopsy is done the other thing seventh thing that i wish that the orthopedic surgeons remember is when you are sending the patient for a biopsy especially for a ct guided biopsy it's a good idea to mark the incision that one is going to take for surgery now this is important because many radiologists may not know what is your plan or they may do what is a conventional we know in the knee that the conventional incision is a midline incision but it's not an incision that we use as tumor surgeons for doing our limb salvage surgery our incisions on the knee are always medial or lateral so it's a good idea to mark them it's particularly important in the femur particularly in the proximal femur where all the incisions that we use are all lateral whereas most of the time a radiologist finds it much easier to do a ct guided biopsy from the anterior side or maybe even sometimes from the posterior side you can see in this particular case that the mass is all medial so there may be a temptation to do it from the anterior side but we have to clearly mark the incision on the lateral side because we are going to go in from the lateral side and not from the anterior side you can see here you don't mark the incision you think it's going to be a midline incision and it will result in a disaster this was an open biopsy done from a midline incision and this is very difficult to salvage the cordyceps mechanism it's going to end up with fusion another tumor assumed to be a giant cell tumor operated from a midline anterior incision this was actually an osteosarcoma and of course needless to say it was a disaster even in the shoulder our standard incision for a biopsy is, is not the deltopectoral but it is through the anterior deltoid so that the hematoma can be contained within the fibers of the deltoid so the next thing that i wish everybody remembers and akshay again pointed it out is pathological fractures are not an emergency when one sees a pathological fracture let's not be in a hurry to nail this this was a young boy Who, who fell when he was playing football on a field was taken to a major hospital ended up being nailed the surgeon thought that just sending the intramedullary reamings would be adequate did not do a formal biopsy did not do any imaging at that time assumed this to be a unicameral bone cyst because it looked like a well defined lesion it thigh started growing in size when we did an mri we found that there was actually a mass and then this was biopsy this was a high grade sarcoma so this is something which happens very uh, very often if we don't do investigation before nailing these fractures and then finally we may end up having to do a total femur which was clearly not required had we got the diagnosis and done so as a rule if it's not an emergency we act with priority not as an urgency and that applies very well to pathological fractures we need to image them we need to biopsy them and then we need to operate them the ninth thing that i wish for an orthopedic surgeon is treat chondroid lesions with more respect again dr shiram did show some of the chondroid lesions i think it's a very good idea to say that we should not assume that any chondroid lesion is a end chondroma if it is an end chondroma then it doesn't require a cure at all so if you assume it's an end chondroma then don't operate but we shouldn't cure it a lesion assuming this is an incord and this is an example this was a 62 year old lady who had an x ray done for pain in the knee which which everybody gets because of of a little bit of arthritis with aging this is very clearly a big lesion it's bigger than 5 cm there is scalloping you can see on the mr this is not to be taken as an incord roma unfortunately this lesion was curated and this was actually a chondrosarcoma they this curatage now makes further management very tricky and difficult in contrast this was a patient who had a fall when the x-rays were done it looked like she had a pathological fracture through the chondroid lesion it was referred in time we did a pet ct scan suv max was 4.6 anything more than 4 we know this is a grade 2 chondrosarcoma so we went ahead and resected it and it was a grade 2 chondrosarcoma so if this lesion had been curated we would not have ended up with good function as we got on this particular patient this is another example of a of of a chondroid lesion 
and the x-rays didn't show anything. This was a 55-year-old lady with hip pain. You can see all the x-rays didn't show anything. The bone scan showed an active lesion in the pubic ramus. So an MRI was done. MRI is very suspicious from its appearance of a chondroid lesion. You can see here. The surgeon correctly did a PEC CT scan because initially he didn't suspect chondroid. He was thinking it's a metastatic lesion. They found that the SUV max was high. It was 15. So the surgeon did a biopsy. And a needle biopsy showed this is a chondroid lesion. Now, a chondroid lesion with an SUV max of 15 cannot be benign. It is a high-grade chondrosarcoma with if the SUV max is 15. However, the surgeon went ahead, curated this lesion, and did a total hip replacement. And this was disaster because now we probably need a hindquarter amputation to salvage this patient. We can see over a period of time, this tumor came back as it was expected. The SUV max is 9, and this was actually a dedifferentiated chondroid. The last thing which I'm going to aim is by saying that when you see a patient with skeletal metastasis, it's important not to assume this patient is going to die. Today, with good medical management and involvement of the oncology team, many of these patients will live for a long period of time. And I'm just going to give you one example. This patient had presented to us with a swelling in his forearm. When we biopsied this, this was a metastatic adenocarcinoma. The primary was in the lung when we did a PET CT scan. So this was a stage four, but this was a solitary lesion. We put this patient on chemotherapy. You can see the PET showing the lesion, a small lesion in the lung. He had a good response to chemotherapy. So we resected this lesion. We resected the lung lesion. We did this as a primary sarcoma, not assuming that the patient is going to die. And this patient today, more than 11 years after his surgery is still alive from a lung cancer with bone beds. So this happens, I mean, many of our patients with renal cell cancer or thyroid cancers or breast cancers are going to have good survivals. Many of them may live more than five years. So whatever we do for them, I think it's very important that we involve our medical team early. So just to summarize, I'm going to say that we have to follow the Hippocrates principle of not doing any harm. As orthopedic surgeons, we all know we like to operate, but I think we need to think hard before we do any surgery. And unless we have a confirmed diagnosis, we should not put a knife in because it can cost a life or limb to somebody. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Manish Agarwal. Dr. Akshay, uh, I'll hand over to you. But before you start the discussion, there is a question from the audience. Can you take that? Dr. Akshay? Yeah, sure. Please go ahead, sir. This is a question from Dr. Roshan Yadav from All India Institute of Medical Sciences. His question is, what is the micrometastasis? Can it be detected by PET scan, bone scan, or high-resolution CT scan, chest? And how do you detect it? Okay. I'll request uh, Dr. Uh, Manish Agarwal to take that question. So, so can you just please repeat the question? Yeah. What is micrometastasis? Can it be detected by PET scan, bone scan, or high resolution uh, CT scan of the chest? And how we uh, we should detect it? Yeah. So I, I think this is this is something which as a concept was not understood till the time chemotherapy came in. Now micrometastasis means metastasis which is existing in the body, but which was not visualized by the stand routine imaging that used to be done in those times. And when I'm talking of the 1970s, we did not have CT scans in those times. And we were, we are talking of chest x-rays. And these micro meds were the reason that uh, the patient had progression of disease and died despite doing an amputation or doing radical surgery. Now today we can dis uh, discover or detect many of these meds by doing a CT scan. Now, again, a very good question is that we don't require an HRCT, a simple spiral CT with two mm slices, which are contiguous, is good enough to screen for METs without giving a very high dose of radiation, which happens with an HRCT. So if, if you do a CT scan, you pick up nodules, which are in, uh, two millimeters, three millimeters. I'm sure Dr. Sriram will be able to tell us. 
and those still we don't know whether they are mets or we don't know whether they are granulomas in our country we see them pretty often so but they would heighten height up our uh, suspicion that we could be dealing with metastatic disease when you have a primary involved somewhere and you would like to keep a watch on that so all micro mets are not still visible because you will see metastasis only when the nodules have become of this size and that requires millions of cells they even if you didn't have any metastatic disease and you had a negative ct scan if you didn't give chemotherapy to these patients maybe of osteosarcoma or even sarcoma they would still die of metastatic disease in future and that's because there is metastasis at cell level at at a few cell level and this will become apparent only over a period of time as these mets would grow so what chemotherapy does is to kill these micro mets and that's how you have survivals because of chemotherapy and that's why you even if you don't detect metastasis you assume that any patient with a with a decent sized tumor visible on the imaging has micro metastasis to begin with and is going to need chemotherapy for getting a solution to that yeah thank you uh, thank you dr agarwal and i think that settles the uh, query so i i think i'm going to ask dr shiram to tell everybody what is the kind of imaging that we need when we ask for ct scans because there is a big confusion on this people ask for hr cts they ask for different kinds of cts they ask for contrast cts what is it that you would recommend for a patient who's being screened for metastatic disease um so i <laughs> the thing is that uh, in today's day and age if we have a decent kind of a uh, ct scanner then uh, there is practically no difference between an hr ct and a plain ct because most of the multi slice scanners are all 0.6 mm and less so if you are taking a 0.6 mm slice uh, you know you can go ahead and in a single spiral uh, get hundreds of uh, thousands of images through the lungs and you can reconstruct it in an hr ct mode or you can reconstruct it in a normal ct mode the issue was uh, earlier on say in 2000s when we actually used to do spirals and we actually used to do hrct for a lung uh, metastatic screening just ask for a multi slice ct uh, we don't need a contrast until unless we're looking for a soft tissue mass in the lungs so if you do a plain multi slice ct of the lungs uh, you'll be able to get 0.6 mm slice um, sections and we'll be able to pick up small small nodules like less than a millimeter like maybe 0.5 mm nodules in fact when we go through our uh, ct scans like you mentioned we tend to see in any normal individual also they get about 4 to 5 to sometimes 10 nodules uh, it becomes a challenge to figure out which of these nodules are abnormal pet works if the nodules are larger in size if they are more than 5 mm in size then you will be able to detect the what is what exactly is happening if they are smaller you might not be able to pick up any uh, uptick in them great uh, thank you dr shriram and i think we'll quickly move on to the panel because uh, that is going to be a much awaited uh, part of this uh, akshay can i webinar akshay? dr akshay yes sir this is dr sharad agarwal uh, yeah. i want to ask you regarding the site of biopsy the classical teachings have been uh, that you do a biopsy at the junction of normal and the abnormal tissue so do we that still hold ground or do you go for the main mass or to depend on imaging to take a biopsy yes so so it will depend on imaging to take the biopsy and the junction of normal and abnormal doesn't hold we usually want to uh, address the soft tissue component if that is available and the part which is not cystic or necrotic is is uh, is representative and that is what we target okay. thank you dr akshay dr akshay this is dr avinita yeah. roda Uh, yes, but it, uh, uh, just adding to the doctor Sharad Agarwal's uh, uh, query, it is always said that you should always take a normal tissue also just to compare so that the biopsy can be clear. So isn't it better to uh, take a normal tissue near the junction area only? No, not at all. It's 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 not as if you need because an expert pathologist will know the difference, and you don't need uh, really need normal tissue to compare. We don't do it anymore. Not at all. that means the only the main main portion of the tumor has to be taken out yes. for the junction not the yes 
Yes. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Yogesh Panchwag has lined up a very interesting panel, uh, which will highlight all that you need to know about malignant bone tumors. And quickly over to you, Dr. Yogesh Panchwag. Thank you very much, Akshay. And uh, thanks to the Delhi Orthopedic Association and the Delhi Musculoskeletal Oncology Group. We'll be quickly uh, moving on uh, to the uh, cases. Okay. Uh, so... We'll start right away. Uh, I'll give you a short history. This is a seven years old boy who presented with a painful swelling just of a one month's duration uh, beneath his uh, right knee. And that is what uh, the x-ray was. And we have an, uh, you know, very expert panel uh, lined up for us. And we do have, like we have in our multidisciplinary team meetings, we have a radiologist, medical oncologist, radiation oncologist, and obviously orthopedic oncologists who are involved. So I'll quickly ask uh, Dr. Amit, uh, uh, as a radiologist, what he would think of this particular X-ray. Dr. Amit Sahu, is he there? Yeah, I'm audible. Yeah, yeah, you are. Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so this uh, uh, unfused bone uh, in the tibia, we are able to see a large. Uh, uh, can I mark the? Uh, am I be able to mark it the lesion? I'll 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 have to use my cursor, sir. You can you can just okay. carry okay. on. Yeah. So uh, this is a large uh, lytic peripheral lesion, which is not crossing the uh, physis, and uh, uh, along with that we see uh, there is the transition zone uh, is not well defined to uh, along the inferior aspect. Though medially we can see maybe some sclerosis uh, is there. And uh, this lesion is also causing some uh, pressure uh, 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 on the epiphysis of the fibula as well. Uh, so this is definitely an aggressive lesion, and I think there must be there is a, some uh, periosteal reaction in the inferior aspect as well, and uh, uh, so there can be an associated soft tissue uh, component to it. So definitely, okay. yeah. So so definitely, this is a uh, aggressive uh, lesion which is seen in the uh, uh, diametaphysis region of the proximal tibia. The okay. All right. So if you want to word it, what will you word the report as? Yeah. Uh, so I would uh, definitely say it to be a malignant, uh, primary malignant bone lesion. And uh, uh, considering the age and the site, uh, my differentials will be an Ewing sarcoma. Okay, all right. Uh, my question to Dr. Lajit. On this, Dr. Sharad Agarwal, this side. Yes, sir. Uh, regarding the uh, zone of transition, here we have a very sharp contrast between the lytic area and the rest of the bone. Will it be taken as a narrow or a wide zone of uh, transition? So, um, if we see in the medial aspect of the lesion, uh, so there is a narrow zone of transition. But as you uh, see the inferior uh, aspect of the lesion, uh, there is uh, the margin is not well defined where you can see a periosteal reaction as well. Okay, all right. See, most of us might not have the expertise of Dr. Amit and Dr. Sriram available. So let me ask Dr. Lalit Maini. Uh, Maini, sir, uh, what will be your line of uh, action now? What will be your uh, thought process? So at seven years of age uh, and a child who has pain for a month or so. Yeah. Uh, uh, at seven years, you don't know when kids would be falling and having injuries. But uh, there are only two things which you need to think about. Is it an aggressive cyst or it is a malignant uh, sort of a scenario? Uh, now, Would you think of an osteomyelitis in such a case because it's a seven years old boy, typical age, mm -hmm. aggressively growing, uh, you know, rather aggressively, I would say, growing lesion. Would you mm -hmm. think of an osteomyelitis kind of a differential in this? Not really. If uh, I have the history along with me, which uh, doesn't point towards anything or uh, no past history of fever, or nothing locally as any sign which uh, point towards infection, uh, would still keep it as an aggressive cyst and be worried that why is the pain there? Has the kid fallen? And the worrying part at the lower end is that periosteal reaction. Yeah, over here. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So. Can what? I uh, just... Yeah, Dr. Sriram. Yeah. So uh, the thing against an infective uh, lesion is that if you see the 
metaphyseal margin it's uh, quite clean and there's no widening of the uh, physial plate typically okay. if you see an yeah. uh, infection it tends to have blurring of the uh, metaphyseal margin and the physial plate tends to get widened uh, like amit mentioned this is uh, predominantly an eccentric geographic lytic lesion with a uh, wide zone of transition inferiorly it looks like it's got a cordman's like periosteal reaction, reaction inferiorly and it's leading out so that there appears to be that there might be some amount of a soft tissue uh, definitely further imaging would be required it's an aggressive lesion and it's it's quite uh, elongated also so we do need to figure out what's happening on the x-ray because it's projectional the narrow okay. zone of transition might actually be uh, not really that narrow because uh, depending on how the scalloping is occurring inside so okay and another right. thing i keep investigating with such a patient is show me another x-ray which you got done one month before or is this okay. x-ray a one month old x-ray as right. sri ram said that so you are wor worried about the change in the picture of the x-ray so if so you have this, x-ray at uh, one month uh, gap that gives you a very good idea what's going yeah on. so as since you asked for it this is an x-ray which was done 15 days later 15 days later the prior one was the presentation x-ray and this was done 15 days later dr shriram uh, yeah. dr amit so uh, any pointers now <laughs> two things that have happened one is the wide zone of transition uh, also involving the uh, the medial margin uh, that there does also seem i don't know whether because of the quality of the x-ray or maybe it's really there there does seem to be some amount of widening of the uh, physial plate and okay. soft tissue mass seems to have increased periosteal reaction also has gone um, has increased and going even more yeah. very yeah yeah uh, all yeah. of these imply that this thing has increased quite a lot in size in 15 days for it to increase in size as a uh either it has to be an extremely aggressive bone tumor okay uh, dr sagar uh, can can we have your inputs please uh, what what do you think what would be your uh, next line of action here sagar sir yes can you hear me yeah yeah we can we can what what yeah, do you think you. now what what should be done now <laughs> Now, now this X-ray looks uh, very different from where the previous X-ray was. Little misleading, except there was some uh, periosteal reaction down, and there was some soft tissue mass, which was an area of concern. But now on this X-ray, the lesion is growing in size. There is a significant soft tissue mass. Probably there is definitely a periosteal reaction. There is definitely some element of wide zone of transition which is being marked. And I'm yeah. definitely not going to leave this lesion here, and I need to image it further. And, and what would uh, you like to do i would like to have a definitely a local further imaging in the form of an mri of the full length of uh, from knee to ankle okay. and also an uh, x ray chest or a maybe ct chest uh, but that's just to maybe we get an mri and then go ahead okay well uh, chetan do you agree uh, any other suggestions from the other panelists any other thought process anything on clinical examination I mean, anything which can uh, give us something uh clinically there was a soft tissue mass over there which was tender uh, anterolaterally uh there was no uh, rather not perceptible uh, perceivable increase in local temperature no lymphadenopathy no distal neurovascular the knee range of motion was terminally restricted but that was expected with this kind of a mass just close to the knee yogesh where was the pain pain was at the site or was it going down the leg no it was on, on the site of the mass anterolateral this is a very aggressive looking lesion in the proximal tibia and yeah. uh, definitely you know the real concern here is whether it is a malignancy infection is always a possibility correct It's always a differential for any aggressive you know pathology so definitely this needs further imaging in the form of mri with contrast as dr okay. sagar said is showing all the way from knee to the ankle Okay, so that's that's the. Uh, I just want to add one statement. Yeah, Agarwal sir. I mean, when you look at the first X-ray, a standard orthopedic surgeon has a tendency to think this is infection and go and curate this without. Correct. Infection. Correct. That's right, sir. And the whole idea of this symposium is that you have to prevent yourself from doing that. Absolutely. So I think when you see a child who's got a lytic lesion with a periosteal reaction, your antennae have to go up. 
yeah have to start suspecting that this could be something sinister you yeah. need to have more information before you catch that knife and before you pull it yeah that's right so i'll just dr. run through the dr I'll akshay run. one one thing uh, at what stage would you like to go for the pet scan in this kind of scenario uh, chetan you want to take that question when when would you like to do a pet scan yeah i need to first know what exactly this is there's no point in doing a pet scan you know right in the beginning right now we have not identified what this pathology is pet scan is more for staging of any disease rather than you know primary diagnosis so i would want an mri with contrast and further i would want a biopsy of this region and then decide whether there is a need for a pet scan or not okay so now since we do have the mri scan my question to dr shriram and dr amit uh, what would be your thought process now i have put up some representative images from the mri as was requested by uh, uh, the orthopedic oncologists in the panel yeah. i'll just run through all the slides for you you can ask me to stop whenever uh, you want to comment so uh, as you see here so the lesion is uh, corresponding to the uh, lytic area which we saw in the x ray so yeah. which is uh, in the contrast images you are seeing there is significant heterogeneous enhancement is seen there is periosteal elevation and there is yes. a edema in the marrow yeah as well as uh, there is edema in the muscle yes right? and uh, uh, the signal uh, within this uh, lesion is quite heterogeneous and it is uh, there's a large area superiorly which is uh, having a uh, significant enhancement on contrast image yes so uh, this definitely looks like to be an aggressive lesion and okay. uh, in the mr uh, the other thing is here it is not crossed the physis and still it is in the uh, meta diaphyseal region and uh, uh, there is no intraarticular extension as well so uh, still i will keep the possibility of aggressive bone tumor in this mr okay dr shridam uh, so basically if you look at the lesion uh, like amit mentioned it's heterogeneous there's hemorrhagic areas within it there's t1 bright areas which you're seeing on the axial uh, and the plane scan the like this, the image on the left i'm sorry go, can you go yeah. back to the first one this is uh, the axial or you want the axial you wanted the axial so just start with the coronal i'll, I'll keep mentioning coronal okay, okay. So the image on the left these are showing the bright areas on the t1 these are plane images and these are hemorrhagic areas the bright stuff Yeah. Uh, on the uh, middle images the the t2 fat sat images we are seeing some dark areas again those are corresponding to hemorrhage and there are some other areas which could be cyst or could be tumor uh, on the contrast images we are seeing that the superior part of the lesion is showing a lot of enhancement there's wall enhancement and soft tissue enhancement outside of the cortex and periosteum also like amit mentioned there is edema and there's also enhancement within the lesion uh, next slide please yeah um in the next set of images again we can see uh, we can see some dark areas on the uh, i think these are probably t2 images and uh, this raises a possibility like if we see dark uh, areas on both t1 and t2 those things raise a possibility that there might be some osteoid uh, or 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 some calcification of some sort so like amit is saying uh, none of this thing looks like it does not look like a benign thing it does not look like a hematoma it does not look like uh, an infection uh and i if you go go on the actual images you not only see that uh, the lesion is lobulated it's expanding the cortex but it's also going there's a soft tissue component uh this involvement of the popliteus uh there does not seem to be involvement of the tibial nerve you if you yeah that there over there that's the tibial vessels and the, the tibial nerve is right over there uh, the dot over there yeah that one and uh so most probably neurovascular bundle is not involved muscle is involved uh so it's gone across a compartment and there is some i don't know whether this this is a uh some biopsy or an injury uh the, the yeah top, that there this this particular mri was done after a biopsy was performed yeah, yeah, by because, somewhere else the top right image shows uh, uh skin breach and soft tissue the top right image and yeah uh, here and you can see that that looks like probably a biopsy has been taken from there yeah, and very nice uh, yeah, yeah. that's correct this was done this mri was done after the biopsy yeah okay so uh, mani sir what would be your line of action now so you want to tell me the biopsy report or uh, you want me to guess yeah so i uh, let's assume that you know this was the, this is the a biopsy report was not been done now would you like to do a biopsy would you like to go ahead with a definitive sort of a management 
what would be your uh, action now? What will be your line of action now? Yeah, definitely after the MR, uh, you would counsel the family that it is something aggressive. It yeah. needs a, a biopsy to be done. And okay. uh, that should be the next step. Okay. Your choice of biopsy, needle biopsy, open biopsy? Needle biopsy. Core needle okay. Biopsy. And would you agree with this particular site that was taken? This seems to be anterolateral. Yeah. So I think uh, they've tried to go straight into the lesion without uh, contaminating any muscular regions. All okay. the tumor is already uh, penetrated uh, the anterolateral compartment, more so posteriorly. Okay. All right. So uh, before the biopsy, would you like to get any other investigations done? Uh, or you would be happy getting only uh, the MRI, the X-ray, and maybe a chest X-ray? I think I would uh, go with the biopsy. Okay, all right. So the report on this particular biopsy turned out to be an osteogenic sarcoma. Uh, this was a high-grade conventional osteosarcoma in a seven years old in a proximal tibia. Uh, so Chetan, the next uh, question to you would be, what would be your next line of uh, action? Yeah, now, now uh, that we know that this is osteogenic sarcoma, we need to stage this patient. Yeah. We need so to, how would you do that? Yeah. See, uh, what we what is conventionally and I think still in the recommendation what they follow for osteosarcoma is a whole body uh, a bone scan and a, a CT of the chest, high resolution CT of the chest is okay. the standard procedure that follow. But nowadays I do a whole body PET CT scan. Uh, okay. For staging because in one initiation it basically gives me all the information that I need. Okay, all right. Uh, uh, Dr. Sagar, Dr. Akshay, do you, do, would you uh, agree with what Chetan has said? Any yeah. other suggestions? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, but Dr. Yogesh, I have to pass a comment before we do, yeah. a, uh, before I do a biopsy, when I'm suspecting a, a tumor there, I would definitely finish with the CT scan chest as Dr. Um, uh, Chetan just pointed out and also would do a bone scan if not PET scan is available. And then would I would do the finish thing, the staging before I jump in for the biopsy. That's just a, just a adding to it. Okay. Any particular reason for doing that in the in the, the sequence? I mean to say. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if if for example, if I uh, do the biopsies before doing any kind of MRI, it's like for, uh, before I do the sequence, then like I may be contaminating. I may be interfering with the imaging of the bone. I may be interfering with the uh, I have to know where the disease is, how widespread it is, and then do the, the biopsy and plan the biopsy accordingly. Okay. I mean, that's, that's, that's a dictum which we anyway need to follow because uh, for a high-grade sarcoma doing biopsies before we uh, finish the staging imaging, it might be like sometimes problem for us. Okay, Dr. Manish Agarwal, any, uh, any thoughts on this? Yogesh, uh... I, before going to staging, I'm very, very unhappy with the site of the biopsy. Yeah. Okay. That is, that yeah. needs to be pointed out. I think the biopsy has gone bang anteriorly next to the tibial tubercle. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's not good because it's contaminating a vital part of our extensor mechanism. Okay. So this is something I think we need to point out that you have to stay away from the patellar tendon, from the tibial tuberosity and do the biopsy a little away. Yeah, from, from there, here maybe. Because you are going to reconstruct those areas and, and, and you don't want the patellar tendon to be contaminated for any, any reason. Yeah. And one other word of caution which I want to add, which, which I want to bring out is, I don't think we should talk about open biopsies at all. I, don't, I think that's a done thing. In, in today's world, open biopsies will be done only at tumor centers if they feel they can't get the diagnosis with a needle biopsy. If an average orthopedic surgeon is going to do a biopsy, it has to be always a needle biopsy or he should not be doing a biopsy. Okay. That's a very, very strong message which I want to give across because I think that's the basic problem. We are only doing firefighting afterwards on a case which can easily be salvaged at the cost of uh, the functional results and or the limb for the patient. And this is something which you have to keep in mind. I think, I think the root message has to go that we are not going to do open biopsies. And unless you have the experience and unless you know for sure what's going to be your final plan of treatment and what's going to be your incision, you are not going to do an irreversible damage for a few months. Yeah. 
Sagar sahab, you, you want to say something? Yeah, Dr. Vish, I, uh, looking since we're looking at the MRI pictures, I'll be definitely no, keen to know what was the intermedial extent of the tumor, the length of the uh, tumor, which was not commented upon, and also any skip lesions anywhere. Uh, just, uh, okay. So these are just two additional things which we... Yeah, no skip lesions anywhere. Probably not crossing the physis. Okay, so on the staging, uh, the bone scan did not show any uh, skeletal metastasis. The CT chest did not reveal any uh, any pulmonary uh, lesions. So coming to the management of this particular case now, seven years old kid with approximate tibia, non-metastatic uh, osteosarcoma, and we have uh, Dr. Uh, Devabrath uh, over here. He is a medical oncologist, and he's going to guide us regarding how he would uh, manage this particular case. Obviously, in osteosarcomas, we are looking at chemo as well as surgery as the as the treatment modalities. So Devavrat, can you uh, tell us about uh, how you would uh, manage this particular case? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Yogesh, and good evening to all. Uh, just, just to add uh, one thing, if you're ever going to do a PET scan, you need to tell your nuclear medicine department that it's got to be a head-to-toe PET scan instead of the conventional above knee because that's where most PETs can stop. They stop above knee, right? So well said. Yeah. in the high volume centers, they know that for bone cancers, it has to be a head to toe PET scan, if that's what yeah. you're using. Yeah. So coming back to your question, I think uh, it's, it's very well established that chemotherapy adds to survival. In most of our patients, most of our centers now, we start with new adjuvant chemotherapy, at least three to four cycles of chemotherapy. So that's about nine to 12 weeks of chemotherapy. Obviously, there's a lot of controversy as to what is the appropriate regimen uh, when you're using new adjuvant chemotherapy, we know that cisplatin, doxorubicin are the backbone. But in most cases, we'd like to do a three-drug regimen instead of a two-drug regimen. Uh, there's been a lot of debate about the role of high-dose methotrexate as well. But at a minimum, I'd like to do at least a three-drug regimen, three to four cycles. That's about nine to 12 weeks of chemotherapy followed by a reassessment for response. Okay. All right. Uh, question to Akshay. Akshay? Uh, yeah. What, yes, you, yeah. What would be your line of treatment for this particular patient? He's responded well. The mass has gone down. The extent is the longitudinal extent is the same as you saw on the on the MRI. What you would do? You like to get a fresh MRI done? Yes, after of the chemotherapy. Would, yeah. So we would like to know how the chemotherapy has affected this tumor, how well or uh, badly it has responded to chemotherapy. And uh, that is what is going to decide a, a resection also. Your margins will be decided by the pre-chemo MR or the post-chemo MRI? Well, mostly it will be decided by the pre-chemotherapy MRI. Yeah. But uh, at the same time, uh, edema which has resolved uh, after chemotherapy and if it involves an area which is very crucial for the functional outcome, uh, yeah. it might have to be considered to be saved from resection. Okay, so good response. This has responded very well and the mass has gone down. Extent, as I said, longitudinal extent is the same. What, what would you offer him? You know that it's an osteosarcoma. You need to do some sort of a surgical intervention over here. He's a seven years old boy. Uh, the tumor reaching up to the growth plate, probably not extending beyond. What would you do for this particular patient? Okay, so see the discussion for resection and all surgery is, is going to start right at the beginning of the chemotherapy and right. not just now, especially right. because it is a seven-year-old child, but even yes. otherwise. So I yes. always uh, would start my discussion right at the time the biopsy uh, report comes out. And yeah. before I will send it to Dr. Devavrat, I will start talking to the patient or, and the parents about uh, what are the options uh, for surgery. And because this is a skeletally immature child and this is a, a location where we are going to have to resect or remove the proximal growth plate of the tibia, uh, discussion will start around how to, uh, of course, the bottom line is that a complete resection has to be done, which will involve removal of the proximal tibia. And at the same time, uh, how to reconstruct is going to be the center point of discussion. Yeah, so my question to the panelists, orthopedic oncologist was regarding the reconstruction part. Uh, what would be the choice of reconstruction? Dr. Sagar, Dr. Chetan, Dr. Manish Agarwal? Yeah, uh, Dr. Yagesh, I mean, in this particular case, there are, uh, there are challenges involved. First, yeah. we're looking at, do we save the joint or not? Second is, uh, as Dr. Akshay already pointed out, that we, we cannot compromise on the margins, right? So 
uh, the saving of the epiphyseal plate is that a possibility or not how about the reconstruction of the tibial tuberosity part and how about the intermedullary part and how on the back part we are dealing with the popliteus is it crossing the solia line or not so all these things uh, are looked into while uh, planning the resection of this area and obviously we're going through the lateral approach and raising the flaps and taking the whole uh, proximal uh, so are we planning osteoarticular reconstruction versus intracalorie but to my mind since it's a small child and uh, if epiphysis can be spared i will be very happy to do an intracalorie section saving the epiphysis and then do some kind of uh, ecrt is 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 an option for the child other options i'm just giving as surgical options uh, in terms of reconstruction since you asked one is uh, doing a uh, extra corporeal radiotherapy and doing the reconstruction second would be doing a something like if osteoarticular reconstruction i would rather avoid but yes now we have the expandable processes also coming up and all those things last three option and two options are, are because i haven't looked at the mri but i presume that there is a good response from the chemotherapy all that rotation passes and amputations are not a good option are not an option for this this patient okay chetan your options yeah. <laughs> This is a very seven tough one. Old. Yeah, it's seven years old. Honestly, I think you know uh, there is no good answer to this particular case. You know, something that will satisfy everybody. So we need to definitely have a long discussion with the family. Now, in this case, I think uh, saving the growth plate is out of question. The only concern is can we save the knee joint? by you know doing an intracalorie procedure by going through the physis again in a 7 year old i really don't know i will have to take the measurement how much bone you will be able to get what kind of margin you will be able to get but if that is not an option then i think rotation plasty is the only reasonable option that i have of course expandable implant is a choice but the child is only 7 years old i think it is a really a long shot and it is extremely expensive with lot of future procedures you know that may come in and that could be a big problem okay all right but for manish agarwal you have a very long series of uh, non invasive extendable processes so your thoughts on this particular case yogesh uh, chetan has very correctly said that 7 year old is a very difficult problem yeah to handle the growth because it's a boy he's got a huge amount of growth left yeah. even if you think of an expandable prosthesis you have to understand it's not going to be one you're going to okay. need one now you're going to need one after it finishes its maximum length of expansion again right and and then again you will need to at a, a skeletal maturity change it into an adult kind of prosthesis so <clears throat> you're talking of minimum 3 to 4 surgeries right and the cost associated with it and if you're not going to be able to afford a non invasive expandable which is extremely expensive i mean even today it would cost anywhere between 18 to 20 lakhs for a single prosthesis so if you have to do two of them and then again convert it i mean you're talking of a huge expense which most of our patients cannot afford right. so so i think this is something which you have to discuss with the family before you go in now okay. uh, uh, talking about saving the growth plate here with the tumor touching the growth plate i think that's going to be a very formidable option and the only way you can do that is if he has had a very good response to chemotherapy and on the post uh, chemo mrs you can see that the tumor is touching the physis only in focal areas then you can think of doing a canidal distraction and then try to uh, save the epiphysis but that also does not guarantee that the growth plate will be functioning at the end of yeah. this surgery that we do so i i think this is something which we have to discuss with the family and i think the simplest option especially when resources are scarce when finances are scarce is to do a rotation plus cs chetan said yeah. i think we've seen over a long period of time that children adapt beautifully especially at 7 yeah. years of age this child would become so used to his rotation plus cs that he would not miss his limb he would be able to participate in sports and he would be able to do everything what anybody with a prosthesis would have done without the limitations of not being able to run jump or use his limb roughly so i i think my method of choice here if i can't save the growth plate is is going to be a rotation plus okay all right can i sagar sir yeah yogesh can i come in yeah akshay and dr sagar also wants to make a comment akshay first yeah so basically as i said the discussion should start right when the biopsy report comes out this is not something that we can decide in one meeting or two 
uh, our right. uh, job as orthopedic oncologists is to uh, tell the patient how much of the bone is going to be lost in the resection and that is a given that you cannot change once that is done what are the options we usually lay on the table in the first meeting and then uh, start discussing with the patient the pros and cons of each option and then in subsequent meetings as the chemotherapy goes on patient keep uh, they keep uh, getting admitted for further cycles we keep on discussing and they also start thinking and then ultimately we arrive at an option which is uh, you know feasible and uh, affordable both to the parents and right. usually they end up asking what would you do if you, if you were to take a, a call and in my right. uh, my choice here again would be a rotation plastic right dr sagar you wanted to make a comment yeah uh, I, i mean this was to both dr akshay and dr manish i mean, i i agree in principle yeah, i mean you, we need to talk to the patient if the rotation plastic he would accept and showing the videos and all those things but before we talk about ecrt uh, before we talk about the rotation plastic do you keep this in mind if the ecrt for the ecrt i'm not thinking in terms of the artificial plate i'm thinking in terms of a salvage not i'm talking about the growth potential so i i i don't know i still think ecrt may be an option maybe a first option or a second option i mean yeah but that, you know taking that cut through the physis you will have a very less bone left behind only a sliver of bone very difficult to reconstruct those will be the technically challenging scenarios yeah. anyways in, for the short want of time we will quickly move on to the next case uh, this was one lucky boy who was actually uh, found out to be having an osteosarcoma now the next this particular case that i'm showing you was not so lucky it was thought to be an osteomyelitis he was treated with antibiotics treated with debridement thrice and this is what he ended it uh, ultimately this was again a oh, similar oh, osteosarcoma God. in the proximal tibia and now in such a scenario situation it becomes very difficult to salvage uh, the limb in any which ways so moving on to the next case uh, again can i can i say something Uh, yes, sir. Yes, Doctor Maini. Can we have a look at the picture again? Yeah. Is that uh, fungation medial or lateral? Yes, yes. That fungation is medial, sir. Medial. So yeah. So the, the a medial fungation, uh, we need to still look at uh, the MR cuts and the extent of the disease, and not uh, straight away think of an amputation. Uh, yeah, you they, could have you could have an you know sort of an extended indication for a limb salvage over here. but it yeah. becomes the things become difficult giving chemotherapy to such a patient also becomes difficult with fungation with bleeding with uh, focus of infection over there all these will be a very challenging uh, situation you know i know these uh, uh, we we managed a few like this and in those cases we have been forced to sort of uh, do the surgery before the chemo and right. what we've done is we've done uh, a wide excision and we put an antibiotic spacer and a long nail and then gone ahead for uh, chemo and uh, okay. they have been managed in this way okay chetan akshay your thoughts yeah the so basically the message of this particular case is very clear you know how a simple straight forward extremely salvageable situation has become so complicated and life threatening forget about the limb i am worried about the life of this patient you know how badly it has been compromised yeah and as uh, dr mani said very very carefully going through all the mr images and sitting with the radiologist is extremely crucial before you even uh, you even think about uh, salvaging this limb we can right. see there is a medial soft tissue component that is probably intraarticular or if not intraarticular crossing the joint uh, extraarticularly uh, and with the kind of contamination that the surgeon could have done uh, doing this curettage Uh, is is uh, you know anybody's guess so uh, yes uh, in the hands of the expert you might start going through the images uh, thinking about uh, whether to salvage or not but generally uh, such cases end up losing their limbs right right yes okay. sir well one one point yogesh i think here yes, i think dr mayni yeah. i i would be reluctant to do an amputation uh, straight away i think okay. that you're, there is not not much disease on the posterior side and 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 i can accept a fusion here but i think the limb is salvageable so i i think i would agree with dr maini that i would go in without the chemotherapy put in a spacer then give the chemotherapy and 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 uh, if that is what the parents want i mean this is a limb which you can't say is clearly for amputation i mean it's one of the options but yeah. would you not be worried about the option if you know how to do it and if you if you have the facilities 
Okay, would you not be worried about the contamination that has been done because of the previous procedures? No, you, really you, you should excise the whole thing nice and wide, including all the soft tissue. And he correctly pointed out that being on the medial side, you have the soft tissues which can be reconstructed. You are willing to accept a fusion here. You have the nerves which are intact. All your neurovascular bundles are intact. It will require a free flap or some kind of uh, tissue transfer at the time when you do the final surgery. But it is a salvageable limb. It's not something which, which, which should be straight away thought of for an amputation. Okay, all right. Fungating. Okay, so let's let's discuss this particular case. He was a 15 years old student. He had a fall while playing in school and that is how he presented to the uh, casualty of an orthopedic setup. I'll uh, zoom out, uh, zoom in into the x-ray for you. That was the x-ray. He had a fracture uh, neck femur. That is how it looked. Yeah, can we have a, a comment from the radiologist, Dr. Amit? Yeah. So, uh, we are seeing a, uh, a fracture uh, in the neck region of the uh, right femur. And uh, just along the fracture margin, we could see some area of uh, lucencies, which is quite irregular. Even the fracture margin is uh, very irregular. It is not a smooth fracture margin. Yeah. And uh, uh, it is all uh, extending uh, the lucent area there in both sides of the fracture line. So it definitely looks to be a pathological fracture. Okay. All right. Dr. Shriram, yeah, if he's there. Yeah. Uh, so all the things that Amit mentioned is, uh, yeah, so it does look like a pathological fracture. There is uh, abnormal lucency around it. There is one thing which is concerning. Can we go to the next image, please? Yeah. So uh, just to the uh, inframedial margin of the neck, there seems to be some bone formation. Uh, nay, on the other image, the yeah, the right hand side one. Uh, yeah, just over there. So whenever there is any soft tissue with the uh, kind of bone formation, you start getting very scared because we are saying that there is a pathological fracture. That means it's an acute event. So if there is a soft tissue with some amount of uh, bone formation, we are again very scared. It could be a, a, again a bone forming. That means osteogenic uh, lesion. Uh, it, it, there has not been enough time for it to be a you know post traumatic ossification or anything like that so I'm not very happy with that uh, i don't right. see too large soft tissue otherwise uh, right yeah okay so what happened actually in this particular case was the surgeon suspected that there's something going wrong so he got a ct scan done to evaluate it further and this is how the ct looked like Yeah, so we are seeing this uh, area of lucency which was seen in the x-ray. So there is a, a lytic lesion which is uh, near the fracture and uh, the fracture has gone through this uh, area of uh, this lytic lesion. And uh, as Dr. Shriram told, there is uh, the, uh, along the medial aspect of the fracture, we could see uh, some calcification which is also uh, confirmed on this CT scan. And uh, there are other some small bone fragments which are also seen in the anterior aspect of the neck of the femur in the axial images, right? And uh, uh, we are not able to see any uh, large soft tissue component which is associated with this uh, fracture here. Okay, so question to clinicians, Dr. Maini, Dr. Sagar, Dr. Chetan, what would you uh, do now, you know? I want an MRI with contrast. Okay, all right. That, I can't work on this CT at all. Okay, but what are your thought processes? Do you think this is traumatic? This is pathological? No, it is classic pathological, pathological, pathological fracture. It is obviously yeah. pathological, but I'm worried. The x-ray definitely looks more worrying than the CT. Yes. And that is a red flag for me. I definitely need yeah. an MRI with contrast. Yeah. What, what on, suspicious for an osteosarcoma. Highly suspicious for an osteosarcoma. Yeah, right. So what happened was that MRI was not done. The surgeon went ahead and did uh, a fixation of this sorts. Uh, when he did the fixation, he got these readings from the DHS triple dreamer. He sent for histopathological examination, and that turned out to be a high grade osteosarcoma. You okay? so, I don't understand why. Uh, I mean, the surgeon suspected something abnormal. Yes, he did. Got a CT done, yeah. and then refused to uh, believe what the CT is showing. Yes. I think he must have thought it is a on. 
CT. Yeah, the, the pathology was probably missed on the CT scan and they, it was reported as a traumatic fracture and then it, they went ahead and did the fixation. Uh, Yogesh, uh, ha, sir. Yogesh, even on the first x-ray which showed, uh, this is a classical osteoid mat matrix yes. is seen in the yeah. lateral view. Yes. A lot of osteoid. The, yeah, there you can see it. And on the CT scan, you can see that as a sclerosis. Yeah. So, so it's been already goofed up. Yeah. So now we are, we have a patient who has been uh, intervened like this. Uh, I would like to have the inputs from the clinicians. What do we do now? Uh, also from Dr. Devabrat, also from Dr. Ramba, whether she could help us in such a scenario. Actually, I would like to mention that in oncology, there's a dictum that don't treat unless you have the histopathology. So this right. should pass to all clinicians, all orthopedicians as well. Because yeah. many a time we come across a situation where they have done the nailing and all and then we are stuck. Because now we know that the entire pain is contaminated. And right. we are left with no other option than going for amputation or something like that. So okay. this should pass on to all the orthopedicians as well. That if you have a suspicion, don't treat without a biopsy. Right. Now that we have a pathology report which says that it's an osteosarcoma, uh, uh, Chetan, what would you do now? I would still want an MRI. I don't know whether it is possible. I don't know what kind Correct. of implant has been used here. Correct. It's a stainless steel implant. You are going to have artifacts. Uh, that is a big handicap but, for me. Uh, but if it is possible... Now, nowadays, MRI can be done. With the, yes. the so many uh, softwares are available, Maverick software and all that, which yeah. can reduce the effect of artifact. Uh, okay. okay. In right. fact, some MRI centers refuse to you know entertain patients with SS implants. They don't even allow them inside the uh, MRI. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, you That's know, uh, okay, what's okay. what's going on in your mind, Chetan? Why why uh, do, do you are you thinking of something else? I mean, uh, from the management point of view. I want to see what is the extent of soft tissue involvement here. Okay. Lateral part I can manage if you know the surgery has been done from the lateral side but I am worried yes. about the joint itself and I am worried about the medial side where we were seeing some soft tissue shadows around the neck. I want to see whether there is something intra-articular or not. With a you know sort of a neck femur fracture you are definitely worried about I assume. Uh, yes. yeah, the intra-articular uh, contamination. Dr. Yes. Manish Agarwal? Well, a PET CT is a good way of getting yeah. useful information because it tells you where all the activity is. Right. And I think here, whether I will be doing a limb salvage or not would again depend on whether I get a good response to chemo. So if I don't okay. get a good response to chemo, I'm not going to risk a limb salvage here. Okay. Um, if I get a good response to chemo, I can get away with a proximal femur extra-articular resection. And we'll have to reconstruct both the acetabulum as well as the proximal femur if the joint was involved. Which I would suspect, I mean, by default, I would say the joint is involved when you have an intracapsular fracture. Right. That kind of a thing. And particularly, I don't know what has happened during surgery. Whether they have done an open reduction or they have attempted an open... It was a close reduction and fixation. Yeah. But, but, but somebody who, who has gone and believed that report of a traumatic fracture and done this, I don't know whether to believe their notes. And very often the notes are very different from what has actually been done. This has been our experience in the okay. past. So you have to assume that there has been a wide scale contamination and then decide whether it would be safe to do a limb saving surgery after you have considered all the factors. And very important factor is going to be what has been the response to the chemotherapy. Right. So Dr. Yeah, Devabrat, yeah, any change? In your chemo protocols? Yeah, so uh, he's a 15-year-old and adolescent protocols are very similar to what we use for pediatric protocols. Obviously, he would have attained uh, puberty. So I think fertility preservation, semen preservation is also another aspect that needs to be discussed with the patient. Uh, but uh, my regimen would be very similar to what I would offer to a younger patient. So three to four cycles of at least two, preferably three drug regimen uh, to this patient. Okay. Akshay, you wanted to say something? Yeah, what I wanted to say was whether or not uh, uh, an MRI is uh, uh, having artifacts, I would still want to have for whatever it is worth at okay. the beginning of chemotherapy. And All as right. uh, pointed is... out by Dr. Chetan and Dr. Agarwal, uh, we would want to know what areas have been contaminated by the surgery and by the fracture. 
Okay. And by the time uh, the, the neoadjuvant chemotherapy finishes, those areas uh, would have vanished on uh, any new imaging that is done. So uh, for whatever it is worth, I think a con MRI with contrast is still warranted. And of course, okay. as Dr. Manish said, a PET scan would also add value. Yeah, PET scan showed that there was uh, no, this was a solitary lesion. The extension was only in the head and the neck area. The uptake was only in the head and the neck area. And we did not have a chance to get the pre-chemo MRI, but we got a post-chemo MRI done after three cycles of chemo because the patient had already received uh, three cycles by then. And this was the post-chemo MRI scan. Obviously, there are a lot of artifacts. Uh, your thought process now? What's the response to chemo, Yogesh? Response to chemo was, I mean, it was very difficult to assess that on, on the MRI itself. But, I mean, I thought that... Oh, yeah. pet, pet would have helped. In the, the post-chemo pet, you mean? Pre and pe post. You need to yeah, compare. Pre-chemo pre pet was done. Pre-chemo pet was done. Post-chemo pet has not been done. I, I think Yogesh, one of those limb salvage, you have to do that because that's the most important factor, as I said, in deciding whether you will go ahead with limb salvage or not. Yeah, but you will. You are thinking of a, of doing a salvage in this type of a situation now? Yes, as Chetan said, it's the lateral side which is contaminated and if I can outline that and I can get the whole thing out and yeah. there has been a good response to chemotherapy, I think I think I would take that chance. Yeah, you did mention that you would do an extra articular kind of a resection. Meaning if by the you joint was the contaminated, but if the joint is not contaminated, then I, I can do a conventional intra-articular resection. Yeah, so can uh, because Dr. Amit, okay, can Dr. Amit or Dr. Sriram help us from the MRI images here to, you know, say whether we can preserve the joint, we have to excise the joint? So, uh... Apart from this, uh, uh, all the artifacts, the uh, major things which we can uh, point out is uh, there is no uh, soft tissue, uh, residual soft tissue, or there is no soft tissue uh, component here. Okay. The um, bone marrow uh, looks fine. Apart from the third image, uh, where uh, just inferior to the artifact, I could see some, I, I think it is some area, small area of marrow edema. The uh, hip joint, uh, we, uh, uh, it is not crossing and is not involving the acetabular aspect. Uh, and uh, so, uh, grossly, the imaging wise, it looks uh, that the, uh, it has not crossed the joint and there is no soft tissue uh, component to it. And the marrow involvement is not there, apart from the small lesion in the marrow. Or it can okay. be artifact. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, as a clinician who doesn't know much of radiology, Interpreting this MRI is very difficult. And right. in osteosarcomas, I do use, uh, take uh, use of a conventional imaging, the X-ray, at the end of three months of chemotherapy, which gives me yeah. an idea. If the whole this area is, this has is become... The okay. So yeah, it this is after three cycles. So it appears that uh, there is some amount of ossification, or at least the lysis has not increased. And there right. is nothing new on the pelvic side. Right. So a uh, conventional X-ray also would give, give, would give you some idea about uh, what the chemo response has been. Okay, all right. So what, Dr. Maini, what will be uh, your line of management now? Is finished three cycles? Uh, response looks as looks as if it's there, uh, though we don't have a post chemo pet. This is the X-ray and the MRI post chemo. What would you do now? If if you say that uh, the medial side is not uh, contaminated. And, uh, no, it, is, it, it isn't because on the actual sections on the MRI, we don't see any medial uh, uh, yeah. soft tissue component or extension. So, so, but we assume that the joint is contaminated. Uh, would still struggle to find out what is the extent of involvement of the soft tissue which cross the hip joint, meaning uh, the gluteae or the recti. And can we have any hint on is the stabulum involved anyway? Uh, Dr. Amit uh, Sahu mentioned that the acetabulum isn't involved. That, that is based on this limited MRI images that we have got. So, uh, as you can see from my comments, I am very, very, very reluctant. And uh, I need to talk about this even to the patient. That uh, being a pathological factor, being intervened. And now that the imaging is not, not a very, very confident uh, sort of uh, imaging, uh, I would be uh, fingers crossed to salvage this because I'm not very sure that uh, what is contaminated and what is not.
okay dr sagar dr chetan akshay quickly you are uh, uh, option yeah uh, i would consider the joint contaminated okay uh, at least with, with the fracture if not with the surgery okay. we also know that there is no uh, uh, extension into the acetabulum beyond the capsule and Sorry. i will agree that it we have to be very very carefully uh, uh, evaluating salvage versus uh, resect uh, versus amputation i would also uh, consider extra articular uh, resection and then even uh, offer rotation plasty as one option and then uh, in case it has to be the conventional limb salvage whether we want to resect extra articularly reimplant the acetabulum after radio radiotherapy and then use an implant with the proximal femur implant is the other option that is available okay dr sagar yeah uh, i mean my sequence of options in this case would be since there are limitations on the imaging and all the first four, of course is a mutilating surgery like a uh, like a, a hip disarticulation or higher depending upon uh, second would be a proximal femur resection with the rotation plasty or a proximal femur resection with some kind of a fusion uh with the east chair but that's again i don't know how much length will you maintain that's like a third option probably i still think limb salvage is a little challenging uh, decision where the family and everyone becomes a part of it My, the surgeon's problem is has to be shared with the family okay chetan yeah this is a very difficult you know question to answer because there is no clear answer to this situation we can't give a single answer to the patient we need to have a very long chat with the family and the patient and discuss with them the pros and cons of each procedure the risk involved is with each procedure the complexity involved with each procedure the cost involved with each procedure and what they really want if they want no risk you know they don't want any risk of recurrence of disease then definitely it has to be a extra articular resection because that is the only technically at least will be correct in doing that but then it comes with the morbidity of you know losing a part of the pelvis and you know associated reconstruction involved on the other hand going right. intra articular yes definitely there is a smaller uh, you know a little higher risk of a local recurrence of disease but then the procedure becomes simpler more cost effective functionally the patient will be better so it really depends on what right. do they really want and okay so any uh, any role of uh, any role of radiation in such a kind of a scenario maybe in okay. actual uh, you guess yeah. a good way is to get a ultrasound of the hip if you see an effusion okay. you have to assume that the right. hip is involved if you don't see right. an effusion in the hip then you could take a chance if the response to chemo is good and this can only be decided if you know how much has been the suv max reduction between pre chemo and right. post chemo now unless i right. have all this information i don't think i can take a decision and i then right. i don't think it is very easy to tell the patient's family the complexity of this situation i think right. i put it very simply to them about whether it is worth taking the risk or whether it is not worth taking the risk okay and, so and pet shows pet shows excellent response uh, good reduction in the suv max ultrasound is showing no effusion uh, clinically on examination there is no soft tissue component medially or laterally what would be what would be your choice sir then then i would do a proximal femur resection with a wide resection of the contaminated soft tissues i will right. require probably a flap to uh, replace those soft tissues and do put in a proximal femur prosthesis for this patient. okay and question to you dr manish agarwal and to dr ramba any post operative radiation in such a scenario in osteosarcoma well i don't think radiation has any role in osteosarcoma and there has been absolutely no evidence whether even adding right. it after focal contamination has any benefit but right. i can definitely guarantee problems with relation to the prosthesis and the soft tissues if we add radiation to this right so chemotherapy yes for sure but radiotherapy is certainly not okay all right so we actually did the same thing had a long chat with the family explained everything to them and since the response was good we did go ahead as dr manish agarwal stated we you know removed the entire capsule but we did an intra articular resection there was no uh, effusion on table also no uh, you know uh, blood tinge fluid uh, uh, in the hip joint and this is at one and a half years of follow up fortunately the patient still remains uh, disease free uh, we will quickly move on to uh, case number 3 this is a software engineer right hand uh, sorry left hand dominant and he noticed a uh, uh, swelling in the middle of his left arm since the last 6 months and uh, i'll share the x ray with you right away that's the x ray 
a uh, quick word from the uh, radiologist dr amit dr shridam so, uh, there is a large expansile lytic lesion which is seen in the uh, mid shaft of the uh, humerus and uh, if you can see the uh, lateral uh, cortex is quite thinned out even the whole of the cortex is thinned out but lateral cortex is quite irregular uh, there can be a breach in the cortex laterally and uh, uh, there is some elevation of the soft tissue uh, likely there is a soft tissue component which is associated with it okay uh, if you see the transition zone uh, the superior margin uh, looks to be a narrow zone of transition but inferiorly i am not very sure uh, so again uh, this looks looks to be a aggressive lesion with a cortical break and a soft tissue component to it in the mid okay. all right uh chetan dr saggar yeah it's a 14 year old you said and it's no he is 23 23, 23. he is this is a left hand dominant gentleman and uh, the symptoms are for how long it's a 6 months 6 months so yeah. mid diaphyseal lesion at this age i mean uh, the differentials for me would be something like even a, a low grade diaphyseal osteomic <laughs> sarcoma i will keep this possibility on this okay uh, a diaphyseal lesion presenting with some kind of a central lesion which is you know mimics uh, dysplasias and uh, i will not ignore this lesion and like to look, look for further imaging okay chetan your impression on yeah, the x ray i mean it looks to me likely to be a chondrosarcoma chondrosarcoma well he 23 years old diaphysis of humerus yeah but he is about 20 so you know chondrosarcoma of course he is on the younger side of it but yeah. there is something i would definitely you know think of in this particular case okay okay uh, just excuse ah, me dr maini do we have a x ray at an interval no we don't have an x ray no. interval x ray so dash yeah dash is a 23 is going to be something not a routine thing okay so dash is a osteosarcoma yes it can be use of eosinophilic granuloma yes it can be uh lymphoma no so this is a naked lesion so it, it has naked margin and uh, the lateral cortex just outside it you can see a, a very faint uh, oh, yeah just over there you can yeah. see some mineralization over there that's not good yeah so okay uh, sir okay again, sir you're saying something yeah i, I mean thinking of uh, chondrosarcoma means that you're looking at the endosarcoma scalping at the upper end which doesn't look like a very classical picture for a chondrosarcoma looking at this x ray i mean anything can mimic anything but okay. i will still think osteo as the first th then okay all right i'll i'll give you the mri right away for the for the want of time let's quickly go on to the mri okay, okay. i'll share the axials as well yeah these two slides dr amit yeah. so uh, this lesion is, is a large expansile one uh, in the t1 image the first one we could see uh, there is uh, the high signal in the mid of the lesion and uh, there is break in the cortex definitely and there is a large soft tissue component laterally yeah. in the post con the contrast images you can see there is peripheral enhancement there is some nodular enhancement the wall along with that there is some uh, in in the center of the lesion superiorly there is uh, a soft the enhancement is quite significant uh so uh, this uh, and uh, if you see uh, the middle cortex is not breached and uh, uh, the rest of the marrow uh, looks fine there is no skip metastatic metastatic lesion which is seen uh, so this is again is a malignant uh, bone lesion okay mr what what sort of a malignancy would you suspect radiologically so uh looking at the t1 high signal and the uh, soft tissue component is and it's quite heterogeneous lesion so uh, i still think it can be a osteosarcoma thing okay all right uh, staging any different chetan dr saggar dr maini would you do something different for this or mri ct chest and bone scan okay all right biopsy biopsy biopsy, biopsy from where Can you show me for the benefit for the benefit of the audience? Can you tell me from where you would like to biopsy this lesion? Which uh, uh, which route would you like to take? 
this is the mid diapason i would probably is, prefer an uh, you know anterolateral probably an anterolateral okay, so somewhere lateral. somewhere like this yeah 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 right that's the soft tissue extension yes or you can even get through the bone i mean okay. i don't think it is a problem here would you like to target the soft tissue would you like to target both of them no one of them would do i think it is quite okay. representative okay all right so i'll soft tissue okay all right and this is what actually it showed both bone soft tissue were targeted like uh, sort of an anterolateral approach was chosen and this turned out to be a grade 2 chondrosarcoma actually on pathology and non metastatic patient uh dr manish agarwal would you have biopsied this particular lesion uh i think first thing is that i agree with chetan when i saw the x ray when you see that kind of an expansion and you see that soft tissue even on images this does look like a chondrosarcoma right now, when i saw the mr there is another differential which i would think i would add is is a is a chondrofibrous dysplasia because this is not a typical lobulated appearance of a chondrosarcoma it's in okay. the hypothesis but okay. chondrosarcoma still remains in the differential and i would do a biopsy here because the imaging features are not typical now with right. chondrosarcomas where you have very typical imaging features then i don't do a biopsy because then i have no differential diagnosis here i don't right. have a very confident diagnosis because not a very typical radiographic appearance that you have and you need to be very certain about what this is but okay. i would do a uh, if the moment i know on biopsy that this is a chondroid lesion and i would do a pet ct because okay. it helps me decide whether this is going to be a grade 1 okay or whether this is yeah so a pet ct in this particular uh, case was done with a, with a break in the cortex and with a soft tissue component okay all right so actually the metastatic work up included a pet scan with a suv of 3 yeah so suv of 3 fits perfectly between 1 and 2 what, yeah. what we we've seen on that so so here i i would probably wait uh, i i mean i mean i would treat it as a probably a grade 1 i would wait for some time to watch how it is growing if it is growing at a, a rapid rate which means that in 3 months time if i if i repeat a scan and i find that things have increased then i would probably think it's a great proof um, yeah but in the soft tissue extension with a cortical breach are we not really it could still happen with a grade 1 it could still happen with a grade 1 which has been left for a long period of time small trauma uh, a crack fracture through which it, it comes so it it is suspicious of something which is high grade and if i don't want to take a chance i would treat it as a grade 2 and dissect that one okay dr sagar yeah i mean it's great to ask dr manish here because he's a vast experience Dr. Manish, when will you like to? Do, I mean, I will be still in more in favor of resection too in in terms of safety of the patient. So, when will you have a cut off? Looking at the PET scan, that I'll do a uh, curettage versus resection. I mean, see the we we've now been analyzing this for the last twenty years, doing PET CTs in chondrosarcomas and certain things that we've learned, and we're going to publish this data that that is coming out now. If you have your SUV max, which is more than four. it is it is going in favor of a grade 2 chondrosarcoma we have not seen any grade 1 chondrosarcomas which come with an suv max of more than 4 now if we had an suv max of less than 2 it is very unlikely to be a grade 2 then i don't think we can differentiate between an enchondroma versus chondrosarcoma which is more on the imaging and here it is very clear that this is not an enchondroma so then i would have treated it as a grade 1 chondrosarcoma but something which is sitting between grade 2 and grade 4 is something where we've not been able to tell whether this is a grade 1 or a grade 2 yeah and you have to go by the, all the other imaging factors like you have to see what is the contrast uptake you have to see whether there is edema on mri the soft tissue component as it has been said the size of the lesion how fast it has been growing all, all these things have to be taken into account but like i said the message which i would put for everybody is that if you can't tell assume a higher grade so that you don't end up doing the wrong surgery for this patient so and in a humerus you could an intercalary resection and reconstruction is not as big a problem as in the femur so maybe right. this is one case where you would err on the assume this to be a grade 2 and and treat it as a grade 2 chondrosarcoma okay so that was what was done in this particular case uh, intercalary resection fibula uh, vascularized fibula and uh, this is this was a very long term follow up that we have at the end of 6 years you can see that the fibula is hypertrophy and the patient has gone on to have an excellent uh, functional outcome uh, as well it's already uh, on histopath 
uh, grade two again in the final histopathology. Mm -hmm. Okay, Akshay, it's past uh, nine o'clock. Uh, do we have some time to take the next case? Uh, yeah, you can take it. Okay, all right. But uh, it has to be very uh, fast. You know? Yeah, we have yeah. 10 more minutes. Yeah. Okay, so we'll do this as a last case and in 10 minutes. So this is a 24 years old gentleman. Uh, he's been uh, treated for a backache for the last uh, two months and presented to an orthopedic surgeon with a sudden onset inability to walk uh, and uh, inability to pass uh, urine and uh, motions. And he had a grade zero power in bilateral lower limbs. And that was the x-ray that he presented with. Uh, Dr. Maini, what would you do in such a case? Sudden onset paraplegia with bowel bladder involvement. Had been having backache since the last two months. Okay, so in order to save time, obviously the next step was to get an MRI done, and that was the MRI. I'll share the MRI with you, and I'll get uh, Dr. Amit in over here about his uh, uh, opinion as to what it looks like. Dr. Amit? Yeah, sir. So uh, this uh, can just show the MR, the yeah. 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 So uh, we can see there is uh, alteration in the marrow. There is marrow edema. There is a large intracanalical soft tissue component, which is and just the axial ones, axial images. Yeah. So uh, and this is also involving the posterior elements uh, with invasion into the uh, paravertebral muscle, yeah. and uh, uh, this large intracanalical uh, component is causing uh, the displacement of the uh, spinal cord. There. Yeah. 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 So. Uh, this is definitely a, a, a malignant lesion uh, with a soft tissue component which is causing destruction of the vertebral body as well as the posterior elements. Neoplasm or infection? So it is neoplasm. Okay. To me. And any particular guidelines about that for our uh, uh, for our audience? Uh, so here yeah, you can see in the first image axial you can see a large soft tissue uh, which and uh, you can see it is separate from the uh, spinal cord. And uh, generally, this doesn't happen with the infection. Uh, you won't there. Uh, you won't get well-defined uh, area there. And again, you can see in the soft, soft tissue component posterior there is quite heterogeneous uh, signal there on the right side of the yeah there. And uh, okay. uh, it is causing complete destruction of the uh, pedicle as well as the uh, the posterior element there. So uh, this such aggressive type of destruction, uh, it is uh, less likely to be an uh, infective thing. Okay, all right. Question to the clinicians, what do you do next? Do you do uh, further imaging? Do you do a biopsy? Do you do a decompression surgery? Do you put the patient in, uh, you know, on some medical management? What do you do? Dr. Sagar, Dr. Chetan, Dr. Akshay, or, and Dr. Maini? I'll do a biopsy first. Okay. Chetan? Image guided biopsy. What, how is, what is his age? His age is 24. He has got acute onset paraplegia since 24 hours with bowel bladder involvement. Well, I think I would, you know, risk a decompression in him because uh, it's yeah, an the radiologist has told you that this looks like a malignancy. Yes, but with all preparation, I think he would still, you know, benefit to some extent with a decompression. Otherwise, he is going for a permanent paraplegia, whatever is the outcome of his disease. Akshay? See, Yogesh, I will want to uh, see whether there is any scope for a resection in case it comes out to be a primary sarcoma. Okay. Going by this image, that doesn't seem to be a possibility. Okay. And because that's it, that is not going to be possible and emergency decompression uh, is, I think, the right way to go, which will both do okay. a biopsy and give the patient whatever chance he has for a neurological recovery. Okay. Question to, quick, quick question to Dr. Devavrat and Dr. Ramba. We do a biopsy, this turns out to be a round cell tumor. Can I intervene? Okay. Yeah, Yogesh, that's what I was going to say is that I would do the biopsy, get a frozen section done. Yes. If it is a round cell tumor, then I can start on steroids immediately. I can yeah. start on chemotherapy and yeah. then hope that this uh, mass is going to reduce. And we've seen that happen with uh, giving sarcoma and lymphomas. Yeah. Yeah. So question but, to Dr. Devavrat and Dr. Ramba. We do, uh, we do a biopsy, maybe do a frozen as Dr. Manisha Karwal has said. What would you suggest? You were, are you confident enough to, so if it turns out to be an Evig sarcoma that we can treat it with chemo and radiation? 
or what would you advise the surgeon to be go ahead with the surgery yeah so uh, if if it does if it is a round cell tumor obviously the pathologist would need to do further ihc and probably also molecular studies to confirm diagnosis it yeah. could be a lymphoma or a ewing sarcoma yeah and, both and the patient has got paraplegia yeah so in in obviously a decompression has to be done for whatever neurological recovery whatever chance there is as dr akshay suggested but both are quite chemo sensitive and even with ewing sarcoma we do know that there are micro metastases right at the onset so i would be very keen to start with chemotherapy in a in a case like ewing sarcoma certainly if it's a lymphoma then chemotherapy is the backbone of treatment okay dr ramba okay, i'm going to add one thing here is that yeah. look here the entire compression is from the soft tissue Yes, there's no bony retropulsion. There's no collapse we've seen on the X-rays. So this is one case which can respond to just steroids and chemotherapy if it is around cell tumor. Okay, but you are risking you are risking a permanent neuro deficit uh, no. in that particular case. No, if it is to recover, it will recover. If it is even the decompression is probably going to be more traumatic because the way in which the soft tissue will respond to the chemo and steroids in a round cell tumor is exactly the same as decompression. right dr ramba actually in case uh, decompression surgery is not done we can straight away go for radiation also we have many patients where we have started with rt and we have got complete response as well so okay. thinking that even if it is lymphoma if the patient is presenting with paraplegia then okay. also it is going to respond because lymphomas as well they respond very well to radiotherapy so uh, right. we have to save the neuro neurological deficit for this patient so i think right. we can go for radiation we have many patients where we have treated with radiation and they have responded I'm so radiation or radiation with chemo radiation with chemotherapy okay all right okay any other inputs dr sagar i i i would go in for biopsy and radiation and chemo actually okay all right so what radiation we did actually concern yeah. with radiation remember it's it's not a open canal and radiation sometimes increases the edema that's the reason why most yes, uh, we, we add around. the steroid along with uh, uh, you have to add the steroid so yes. steroid is the first thing that you start with yes. if you know it's yes. a round cell tumor yes sir okay. we always add steroid when we start radiation therapy in, in such patients dr manish i have to ask you to, uh, can i ask a question dr yavish yeah uh, yeah uh, please I mean, when you're asking for the steroids, are you put trying to put a give a solimedrol with a full dose within for which regimen are you referring to? I mean, less than 24 hours, eight hours, or or the long onset therapy? Because by that time, biopsy comes and all comes. It's already like maybe a seven eight days post uh, paraplegia. So, is your does the steroid? No, I'm not going to rely on the final report. I'm going to just wait for a frozen to tell me whether this is a round cell tumor or not. Mm -hmm. And and I don't worry about whether this is going to be a lymphoma or Ewing's, and the okay. steroids generally given by our medical oncologists is is dexamethasone rather than solumedrol. Right. But right. but a lot of spine surgeons suppose you are going to do a decompression, you would you probably give solumedrol. Yeah. But uh, again, you can't waste time, so you have to have a frozen section and an immediate diagnosis and an immediate decision. Otherwise, these things won't work. Otherwise, then then it is better to do a decompression if you. Don't have these facilities. Yeah, actually, and, and Yogesh, uh, a word of yeah. caution here is that before you start steroids, you must, as Dr. Manish said, you must take a biopsy. Whether you go for Correct. decompression, because uh, the steroid might actually change the nature and may not the tissue may not be amenable to biopsy at all, especially if it's a lymphoma. Okay, all right. So actually, I'll just quickly share and end the session. What we did, we went ahead, did a decompression surgery. As Akshay, I followed what Dr. Akshay and Dr. Chetan said. and any which ways later on we would not be doing a proper r0 resection for this particular case uh, the the his, we did send a frozen the frozen came out to be a round cell tumor probably suggestive of an ewing sarcoma the final history ihc also confirmed an ewing sarcoma and this we we stopped at a, a simple decompression surgery he was treated with post op uh, chemo and radiation and then later on he went on to have an uh, excellent recovery complete recovery of the neuro neurological deficit no collapse in the follow up x ray as well and a perfectly wow. good uh, functional Fantastic. outcome he has gone on to have a cure so great. i think uh, since uh, any comments great you okay. wish yeah yeah his x ray was interesting it shows that winking out sign yeah, yeah. yes yes the first x ray yeah the first x the first x ray one yeah. particle is absent yeah. yeah yeah there it was 
any wish so thank you very much thank you akshay doa uh, for this opportunity and thanks to all my panel who have very enthusiastically and actively participated and thanks to all the wonderful audience that we have had today over to you akshay well uh, thank you yogesh that was an excellent panel and uh, it did generate a lot of uh, interesting discussion here i really hope and i know that it must have benefited all the uh, the participants and the audience all across the country over to uh, dr sharad dr dhananjay and dr manish dr sharad thanks dr akshay uh, one thing i would say that you are definitely ended up scaring us more and more general orthopedicians more and more but uh, <laughs> from from going anywhere near uh, these things and but i think one thing is very important that you, the level of suspicion has to be very very high the, uh, the thresholds have to be very very low because many of us we would have just taken them as a usual trauma and gone ahead with it so the level of uh, uh, the suspicion has to be very high and that uh, at the slightest of uh, the, uh, doubt we should uh, go uh, with the uh, onco protocols and involving you people and then go ahead. an excellent presentation by all the speakers excellent cases we are much much wiser thank you dr dhananjay uh yeah i have been listening to whole of the session i think it's been a wonderful talk wonderful presentations and i would say rather that uh, when we started with our practice we didn't have such type of exposure and in my clinical experience what we have realized that two or three cases which you thought was simple fracture turned out to be malignant later on so i think the key is to focus on the clinical uh, history taking clinical examination and the plain x ray study i think it can give you so much of information and just don't jump into any surgery thinking that it's a plain fracture that's a message i would like to give i would like to thank all of the panelists it's been a wonderful session really thank you thank you dr hitesh so you are muted dr hitesh you are muted yeah i am on behalf of delhi orthopedic association thank you all dr shriram dr manish dr akshay the lovely case discussion by dr yogesh dr chetan dr amit dr lalit and dr devarath and dr ambha it was a real lovely uh, case discussion and i would uh, thank you all for the uh, good tumor session we had the last uh, last week we had a the ninth tumor and this must have made the pgs merry it was a complete pg course like thing and i would request dr manish to submit his article in our journal journal of clinical orthopedics and trauma and things that an orthopedician should not do it was lovely hearing him also thank you any last comment by professor mani dr lalit mani from doa thanks a lot stay safe stay indoor wash your hands social distancing <laughs> okay and i thank oh, all the faculty especially dr akshay and all the faculty of taking out time and coming to this webinar it was an excellent and uh, more than uh, 1600 audience was there it was a great show and uh, we are very proud of it and i will uh, finally like to thank dr shamshul huda dr ashok sham and dr ravi johan for their technical support and especially the ortho tv and uh, we are very proud of it thank you everyone thank you thank you everyone for your time thank yes sir thank you thank you sir thank you everyone sir thank you we are ending the live streaming sir thank you sir thanks thank you Uh, Ravi, stop recording. Dinner time. Yes, sir. Done. Dinner time now. Done, sir. Doctor Shamsul, we are. Yes, yes sir. We are off, sir. Yeah. We are off and. Uh, so i think it was a great show and uh, very informative and i'm very happy with the audience because for the benign humor it was uh, we had a very good audience
So any comment by Dr. Sharma? Quite informative. Quite informative. I think we should have these kind of sessions periodically as general orthopedicians so that we are wiser and don't commit to not do any harm. Dr. Uh, Professor Manny, any comment? Uh, I've been getting a lot of calls for the PG sessions, the one we were doing on Wednesday. Actually, the last one, the peripheral nerves, uh, the PGs were actually waiting. So I think uh, we should continue on those sessions also. They are pretty comprehensive, especially when they heard that Dr. Dhal is going to join in that session. So all the PGs were uh, sort of uh, calling up. Uh, the lockdowns are opening up now, we are all starting to work. We had a discussion with Dr. Mani and we thought we'll do alternate weeks. One week, okay. we do, the other week we do a proper OR event. Uh, what has happened is we need to do ah. pediatric uh, part C. Pediatric yeah, part C, which has to be done. Shamshal, mute yourself. And after that would be the uh, the uh, the uh, nerve injuries cases on 30th of uh, May, and then we'll have alternate week. Uh, one week, next week, also be, uh, 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 Ashok Sharma has conveyed that the PG courses we have done, the hip and the spine, have been the blockbuster shows. No other webinar has crossed 2,000. And hip had sir, it crossed 5,000, sir. Hip reached 5,000 and spine also reached beyond 3,000. So I think uh, those PG sessions are are going to be the benchmark of DOA. That is being uh, that is being viewed not only by Delhi PGs. It is going all across the country and beyond the country. Yeah, we are, we are okay. from Nepal, Sri Lanka, sab usko attend kar rahe And peripheral nerves are both jaruri hai and uh, the faculty is very nice. Yeah, we are, we are, we are uh, Dr. Uh, we have planned it for 30th, isn't it? No, we have planned, but uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, what PGs want, they actually called me also. They say that you have, uh, you know, if you have started a series, you should finish it off. Sir, we can uh, do, we can do this Wednesday or next Wednesday. Yeah, this Wednesday, do we have a slot? Yeah, we have. we have. We can have, sir. So, if your peripheral now faculty is ready, uh, so we can do something. That's a very, very popular short case. Yes, it's there in every exam. A lot of PGs are waiting for peripheral nerves, especially. So discuss kar let's think uh, about you know, our, uh, I think discuss with Dr. Sharad and Dr. Uh, Hitesh and let me uh, know. Yeah, yeah. But if we have to do it on Wednesday, then by one o'clock tomorrow, I should know it. Only my only apprehension is the senior the senior people will not be able to join that much. Only for then we have to confine to PGs only. I mean that's the faculty. Sir. Mode. Peripheral nerve ke liye to senior mostly betting it because of Jandi Girti, yeah, so how many are the current care? Peripheral nerve to Karwao, both you, it will go to seven thousand map of Ataram. So you, but you want to advertisement ke liye time for a come as a nay Hojaga, sir. People, people are waiting for Hojaga. Peripheral nerve may announce Kardiatana that we are postponing it by one week. Sir, tomorrow is said Sunday. We can uh, we can survey yeah. by evening tomorrow. The things are finalized in the morning. Nee, faculty say we confirm karlo, na? Yes, sir. With, with by after uh, confirmation from the faculty. I think Lalit, we uh, call Doctor Dhal in the morning. I'll call or you give a call. No, no, I will do it. You, you do it. I will do it. And then if he is ready, then uh, we will. Itesh's opinion, let him. Itesh, don't say anything. Itesh, tell me. Okay. Your opinion, sir. Okay. It's okay for me. No, it's okay for him. अभी कह रहा था बैक हो रही है वो तो है ही बैक पेन के बैठे हुए ठीक है चलो ओके बाय डिनर की कॉल आ रही है वन टाइम वेडनेसडे कोर्स और एवरी वेडनेसडे अलग अलग ऑल्टरनेट वेडनेसडे कर लेते हैं नहीं नहीं और सर ऐसा है सर मेरी बात सुनिए जब तक 30th तक लॉकडाउन है तब तक हमारे पास सारे दिन फ्री है सर डेली वेडनेसडे कर लेते हैं तब तक जब तक टिल टिल 30th ऑफ मई दो वेडनेसडे आएंगे उनको हम यूटिलाइज कर सकते हैं उसके बाद तो फिर संडे से नहीं होगा आई डोंट नो वेडनेसडे तो कोई लोग शेयर कर पाएंगे बिकॉज़ वी बी वर्किंग नाउ दैट इज द ओनली प्रॉब्लम वेडनेसडे टाइम इज 7 टू 9 व्हाट सेम टाइम दिस टाइम सो 6 टू 9 6 टू 9 इज टू लॉन्ग 7 टू 9 ठीक है यार बस
ऐसा कर लो एक बार ही कर लो अगर पेरिफल इंजरीज का नर्व इंजरीज का इतना ज्यादा वो है तो देन लेट्स डू वन वेनेसडे कमिंग वेनेसडे ओके देन देन वी मेक इट अल्टरनेट अल्टरनेट हां हां 7 टू 9 इज ओके नॉट 6 टू 9 वी हैव 7 टाइम कर वी हैव गॉट लॉट ऑफ मंथ्स अभी बचे हैं आई मीन वी नॉट बी एबल टू डू अ क्लोज मीटिंग टिल मे बी सितंबर अक्टूबर अल्टरनेट वीक कर लो और पेरिफल नर्व अगले हफ्ते कर एक बार कर लेते हैं उसके आगे कर लेंगे हां बट आई विल कंफर्म यू बाय नून बिकॉज़ मेरे को फैकल्टी सब से बात कर लेता हूं देन ओनली आई विल बी एबल टू कंफर्म बाय नून ओके ओके एंड डॉक्टर शरद हु विल बी डू डूइंग एडवांस ट्रॉमा आई थिंक डॉक्टर 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 हितेश आर डूइंग टू एंड देयर विल बी थ्री टॉपिक्स ऑन द डिस्टल रेडियस डिस्टल फीमर प्रोक्सिमल टिबिया डिस्टल टिबिया डिस्टल फीमर इज बीइंग डॉक्टर विवेक त्रिका प्रोक्सिमल टिबिया डॉक्टर पुष्कर एंड समरजी Okay. And Mr. T B R, Dr. Balwinder and Dr. Maninder. So, can you WhatsApp me the whole thing so we can at yeah, least? Yeah, uh... has to be confirmed by Dr. Sumit Batra, UK. Say, okay? Hmm. That confirmation is available. So that. Only seven June, sir. Seven June. Seven June, yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, the other thing is, if you are not not able to do it on this Wednesday, then maybe Saturday. Uh, no, nah, Saturday yeah. we have uh, no. Saturday we have uh, Dr. Bhave. From uh, Baltimore. Hello, uh, Doctor Mahave mm. is from Baltimore. Se he will be presenting. Then, then, if we don't do it, then it will be done. Sir, actually, I have I have requested Doctor Dror Pele because Doctor Dror Pele wrote to me that I want to do a webinar on CPT. So there was actually a webinar uh, done by Posi for CPT, and he was not very happy. so he said that you know i want to do it so i have requested him that if he could uh, do it on <laughs> manol tigra friday is uh, doctor draw agrees that friday is draws a uh, saturday bhave <laughs> from baltimore and sunday we have and sunday we have our pediatric program doctor dhawan if we are not able to do this wednesday then let it be on 30th then ah then we'll see i'll let you know tomorrow by noon theek okay. hai Let me talk to the faculty. Okay, sir. Okay, thank you. Good night. Thank you, sir. Good night, sir. Good night. Thank you, sir. Good night, sir. Good night. Thank you, thank you, Doctor Shamsul. Thank you, Kavi. Thank you, sir.